All right, let's go ahead and call to order the April meeting of the Alexandria Transit Company Board of Directors. Thank you all for, for being here, and it's very nice to see all of you not in little squares anymore. It's been a long time. Uh, I think we were last here the second week of March in 2020, and I think, Hillary, it was your first board meeting, I, I think, or you may have been transitioning the role. I remember you being here, but uh, um, we've had a lot of changes around this table, but uh, pleased to welcome you all back. And um, we will do an icebreaker exercise in September um, when we have a new board member or members who are seated so we get to know each other a little better. Look forward to that. Um, should I do the public hearing first or do we want to um, take, well, okay, we don't have to read the electronic meeting notice anymore, but let's um, go ahead and call the, uh, call the roll before we introduce public hearing. Chair Kaplan? Here. Vice Chair Kleist? Here. Linda Bailey? Randy Collins, Kendall Taylor. Here-ish. <laughs> I'm envious, Kendall. <laughs> Matt Harris. Here. Hillary Orr. Here. Ajaysha Thomas. Present. Okay, Chair Kaplan, you have a quorum. You have five present in person. Six total. Our first order of business is to have a public hearing on the uh, ATC Transit Development Program for fiscal year 23. Um, we likely have some speakers and some folks who I know signed up for the meeting. I'm going to let um, Martin do a presentation first, um, just to make sure we have a refresher and for anybody who wishes to speak, just so we're all working off the same information. So Martin will walk us through this. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, members of the board. I'm Martin Barn, Director of Planning and Marketing for Dash. Um, Sure, I've got these slides here. Can everyone hear me okay? Perhaps I just want to do a, a, a check since I am the guinea pig on, on speaking here. Can everyone hear, hear me okay online? Yes, Martin, we can hear you. Great, thank you very much. So, um, this is the uh, the next step in our annual TDP process. We, we have a, an annual public hearing that is held, and, and before the start of that public hearing, we usually provide a quick recap of the major service change proposals. Um, and some additional uh, context on those changes. Um, we also share a little bit of a summary of what we've heard from the community so far over the last month during our public outreach process. Uh, the intent of that is to kind of just provide some additional background uh, to help inform the discussion with the board uh, and the public hearing um, and so forth. So I will go through that relatively briefly right here. Um, just for clarification, there's no board action that is required or requested this evening. Um, we will be just listening to the, the public hearing comments um, asking questions, um, you know, there'll be you know, back and forth discussion with staff, um, and the intent is after tonight that there'll be some, some guidance to staff as we can uh, move forward with our revised final TDP, which will be brought back to the board in, uh, in May for a final consideration of adoption. So that's where we're at in the process. Um, there are three major service changes that are included in this TDP that I wanted to highlight this evening. First, Potomac Yard, uh, Metro, and the bus connections that will be provided to that. Second is Line 34, uh, particularly the North Pitt proposal. And then we have some unfunded ATV improvements uh, as well that I'll mention. So just very briefly, uh, to recap the Potomac Yard Metro changes, Potomac Yard Metro is scheduled to open at the end of this year, probably October or November. Uh, we have several changes to our Line 33 and 36 routes uh, that are set up to, uh, to occur when that happens. Um, the main, uh, the, the gist of it is that the 33 and 36 will be modified so they are not going to serve the front of the shopping center of Potomac Yard. They're instead going to be routed to the new Metro station via East Glebe and, uh, and Potomac Avenue. And I uh, don't think I have a pointer here, but hopefully you can see that on the map there. Um, the uh, main comments that we've received, it's been mostly positive on this, uh, on this proposal. The main question that we've gotten is if it's possible to continue to serve the front of the target. Um, we are currently serving the front of the target, which is you know, convenient for people that have shopping bags and things like that. Unfortunately, with this new um, alignment, we are going straight to Potomac Yard Metro and we are not able to circulate in front of the target based on the existing circulation at the shopping center site. Um, but we will have stops um, a little further north in the shopping center, close to where the old Navy and Rack Room shoes are, uh, which is um, kind of see Reed Avenue extended there into the shopping center. There's going to be a, some stops there, and then further north there will be stops. Um, for those that are going to target, there will be stops along East Glebe, uh, which is towards the bottom of the map there, uh, which is a short walk away from target. It's not the front door, but it is relatively close. Um, and this alignment also lets us serve the National Institute for the Blind and the Kaiser facility on East Cleve. Um, so that's that's kind of, um, you know, if, if we were to serve the target, it would have to, we'd have to do a loop-to-loop, -loop, a double circle, which is not ideal from an operations standpoint. It's very confusing, very inefficient, um, and not really something that we want to drag our passengers through. So this is, uh, that's why we've proposed it this way. 
Second proposal uh, is line 34, and this is uh, what we've heard uh, the majority of the comments have been regarding. Um, there, and I should note that the, within the packet there is a summary of all the public comments that we've received. Uh, this is as of last week. Um, I think there's about a dozen comments. There uh, were a lot more comments that have come in in the day since the packet was finalized. Uh, at least 20 additional comments, many about line 34, many related to North Pitt Street. So I do want to let you guys know that those comments are, uh, are coming in. Um, and we will provide a full listing of all public comments as part of the main packet. Um, so the two, the two proposals on line 34, first is that line 34 will no longer go straight to the Braddock Road Metro. Instead of serving Braddock Road Metro, it will go north to Potomac Yard. Um, you can see at kind of top of the map, it goes from Slater's Lane. Instead of continuing south to Braddock Road, it would turn right and go up Richmond Highway uh, through the Metroway lanes and up to Potomac Yard. Uh, that will provide a very important connection from Old Town North. We did get some questions and, and concerns about this. I think folks along Slater's Lane and Bashford were concerned that they would be losing their connection to the Braddock Road Metro. Um, I think there was a little bit of confusion. They didn't realize that they could still make their connection to Metro Rail at the new Potomac Yard Metro. Um, they can also connect to Metro Way there, so they still have those same connections. And it may be a little bit faster if they're going north to Arlington or DC. So we did, I think we addressed some of those concerns. Uh, those that are still wanting to go to Braddock Metro for other reasons will have to find another route um, you know, they may be able to use um, the 30 or the 31 if they can walk down there, but that is a, a one, one gap in the surface. Um, the second part of this proposal, which is the one that the majority of the public comments were focused on, is the North Pitt proposal. Um, as you can see on this map here, we are proposing to shift Line 34 from North Fairfax Street to North Pitt uh, along the segment from City Hall north to 2nd Street. So you can see the dotted line there is what the new alignment would look like. Um, this is uh, was included in our Alexander Transit Vision Plan, which is our long-term plan for the, uh, the city's transit system. It was adopted back in 2019, um, so we, we've been talking about it since then. Um, the, the intent of this change is to provide more useful bus service. Um, there's been a lot of questions in the comments we received about why we would want to do this. Um, the reason is that we believe that this provides more useful service for Old Town North. As you can see on the map, there's a little bit of a gap. There's a four-block gap between Washington Street and Fairfax Street. Um, there's a lot of residential de density in there. And there's a lot of new developments. Um, that are, have just been built or are in the process of being built. Uh, many hundreds of units of residential, um, you know, new uh, grocery stores. There's a uh, well, Madison Montgomery. There's a lot of shopping, um, and obviously there's going to be a lot of an additional demand for people coming to and going from this area. Um, so we believe that by providing some additional uh, transit service along that corridor, we can better meet the uh, mobility needs of that area. Um, and I would just say at, at a higher level, we believe that you know, providing mobility choices is, is crucial to providing a better overall quality of life for the community. We believe that um, you know, the city has adopted their Alexandria Mobility Plan, which is all about providing mobility choices. We want to make sure that transit is a relevant choice for more and more people. Um, not all trips can be made using bus. Many people will need to use cars, but we want to make sure that the trips that can be made using buses have that option with useful bus service. And we believe that that will hopefully help stem, um, or at least begin to uh, help with some of the traffic, parking, and uh, issues that we've heard about. Um, and then on North Fairfax Street, I can just say that uh, you know we have uh, relatively low ridership on Line 34 on North Fairfax Street. Uh, it would no longer be serving North Fairfax Street. North Fairfax Street is already served by Lines 30 and 31, which run much more frequently, much longer span, and they're in much, much higher ridership. So we do have a lot of ridership on North Fairfax Street. However, those, those individuals are using, for the most part, lines 30 and 31 because they're much more useful. They go to the Braddock Road Metro and King Street. Uh, so much more useful connections there. Um, you know, the line 34 ridership is very low along that segment. So it's we feel that buses are, are better utilized uh, on North Pitt Street where they can make more of a difference um, in terms of transit usage. Um, and yeah, so the majority of the comments that we heard on this proposal, um, you know, we've heard a lot of different things, but I think the main theme throughout most of them was the, the concerns about the existing traffic issues, existing parking issues on this corridor. Um, and then also some noise concerns. So, um, you know, we certainly acknowledge those are those are issues throughout Old Town, especially North Pitt Street. Um, and I think it's our, our hope that this this proposal would help to improve those instead of become, um, you know, contribute to those issues. And then just lastly, on the noise issue, uh, the only thing that I would mention is that, um, you know, we, we certainly recognize that, that buses are noise, noisy at times. Um, you know, the, especially the older diesel buses, I can tell you that we have just in the last two months retired the last of our old, old, older diesel, diesel buses, which were the noisiest of our fleet. We're also transitioning towards electric buses. We've got 14 in our fleet. We'll have 12 more coming in the next two years. And you know, by the end of the decade, uh, most of our buses will be electric. So those are obviously much quieter and have zero tailpipe emissions. So just wanted to highlight those, uh, those notes.
Um, and that's, I, I'm going to kind of just move through the rest of I just want to show you this slide. This shows um, North Pitt Street. It shows the uh, developments on the right side. You can see the green are the ones that have been built already. The yellow are the ones that are coming. You can see that a lot of those have you know, multiple hundreds of units. Um, and so that's part of the reason why we are proposing this along North Pitt Street. We want to provide useful service for those individuals, as well as the existing residents. Um, the, the map on the left shows a, a very preliminary map of where some of the potential bus stops might be located. Um, you know, we still have um, a ways to go with city. We're still working with them uh, on the exact locations and, and what improvements would be needed. Um, and, and certainly we're looking for ways we can minimize the impact on parking and make sure that we're providing safe uh, stopping locations. So um, that's the, the extent of my remarks on, oops. I just press one, there we go. I'm not going to really go into the ATV improvements, but this is our second scenario, which has the, the, the additional improvements that require additional funding from the City Council. I have slides and maps of all of these improvements uh, that we've discussed last, uh, last month, uh, but it's line 30, 31, 33, 34, and 32. So if, if those do come up, I can have these maps ready. Um, with that, I, I'll, I'll wrap up by just saying that uh, additional information on the TDP is available at dashbus.com slash TDP. Uh, we've been doing a lot of outreach over the last few weeks, um, and there is a summary, a, a, summary, a summary of that outreach in, the, in your packet. Um, there is still time to get public comments in. Uh, obviously, tonight we'll hear from, from the community, but then there's also the, a deadline of Friday for any additional public comments. Uh, so please uh, provide those uh, by Friday if possible. And that concludes my remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Martin. And as you highlighted, um, public comments that were submitted um, on, through the end of last week when the board packet was, was finalized uh, have been included. So all the board members who are present have received and reviewed those. And we look forward to reviewing additional comments that have, that have come in as well. So um, just for folks who are preparing to speak, just know that we, we have any written comments that have, that have come in and additional ones will be provided. So we're going to move into um, receiving testimony on the um, transit development program. And so we have, um, for those who are watching virtually and, and here in the room, we can see an hourglass that shows three minutes, which is the amount of a lot, time allotted for each speaker uh, who wishes to be, to be heard. And so when someone starts speaking, we'll start that hourglass. And when the time is up, I will um, kind of ask you to finish up your thought, and then we will move on to the next speaker and appreciate um, folks being respectful of uh, the time so we can hear from everyone. So I'm first going to ask if anyone had pre-registered for the public hearing, and then we can take additional comments with folks who are watching um, on the uh, Zoom can use the raise hand feature. Um, is this also on Facebook Live? or um, So folks can put in the chat that they want. Well, I guess someone on Facebook Live, can they can't. They have to be on Zoom too. We'll, we'll, we'll watch it, I think. We'll okay. try to catch it. And and they would have to Whitney, submit a Yeah, Whitney comment. and Caitlin are both okay. uh, monitoring remotely. So when you're ready, they'll chime in and let us okay. know what's going on. It appears everybody in the room is staff. So we have former board member Larry Chambers, who we're actually going to be recognizing after we finish the public hearing for his service. Um, so I will ask uh, if there's anyone virtually who wishes to be heard. Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Um, I do want to let everyone know that this evening we do have translators available for anyone who uh, would like their assistance in providing public comment uh, on this evening's proposed service changes. So I'll pause for a moment so that they can introduce themselves um, and make their presence known. Buenas noches. Si necesita asistencia de traducción en español, Para comentar sobre los cambios de servicio propuestos por Dash, déjenos saber ahora haciendo clic en la función de mano levantada en su pantalla. Gracias. Do we have another translator? Yeah. I think our other translator may be having some technical difficulties, but we do have an Amharic translator uh, available. So if anyone is in need, please let us know and we'll check to make sure that his sound uh, is working. Uh, there he is. Go oh. ahead, Alex. Sorry. Sorry. 
የህዝብ አስተያየት የተለየ ወይም የማጠናከረ ሐሳብ ያላችሁ የስፓኒሽና የአማርኛ ቋንቋ ተናጋሪዎች ራሳችሁ ቋንቋ በሚገባችሁ መልኩ የሚረዳችሁ አስተርጓሚ ስላለን ላካችሁ በስክሪን ላይ ያለው የእጅ ምልክት በመጫን እንደታሳውቁን በትክክለኛ ጠይቃለን አመሰግናለሁ Thank you gentlemen. Um I do see two raised hands. Uh but I what I'm not sure of is if they need translation services or if they're just raising their hand to provide public comment. So we'll start with uh Stanley Stump. Please let us know if you need translation services. If not, you're welcome to provide your comment. still be muted. Hi, Mr. Chairman and board members. Thank you for allowing me to make some public comments. My name is Stan Stemp. I live on North Pitt and Wythe, or with. I'm not sure how to pronounce it yet. From a personal perspective, I moved here and I had the option to move to a street with a bus stop or a street without a bus stop. And I purposefully chose to move to a street without a bus stop. Looking now at the plan, it would put a bus stop right in front of my place and I'm just therefore in opposition to it. I'm also in opposition to it because I have spoken to quite a few neighbors that had no idea that this change was occurring. And I've been able to um, get a few of them to understand what's going on and provide public comment. I believe that if I had a little bit more time, I could provide probably 20 or 30 more comments in opposition. Now, going back one step, I am fully in support of Dash Bus and I ride the Dash Bus. However, I don't understand whether this change is occurring from Dash itself or the riders itself. Because if this line 34 has low ridership, then please be careful because you might be affecting more non-riders, but still Alexandrians by moving it to North Pitt the hundreds of people that live on North Pitt versus the low ridership. Again, I don't know. I'm just saying, please take into consideration that one, I don't believe that we've had proper announcement or availability of comment by the people that live on that street. Again, they may be positive, they may be negative, but I do believe that we need to change the process. So, or at least give more time so that we can have more comments. I also wanna ask the gentleman that spoke from Dash, whether these comments were positive or negative, at least give us an idea of 90% negative, 10% positive, or some way that we can have an idea of what those comments were. You said 12 have been received, 20 more have come in. Just very quickly, if you can let us know. Thank you, Mr. Stemper. You, uh, do you have further comments, sir? That's all. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm going to just for efficiency of time going to ask we have our secretary who is taking notes as is Mr. Barna who gave the presentation. I'm going to ask them to respond to all the questions and comments at the end of the presentation just for efficiency's sake. Um, so if you hang on, we will we will provide that information to you. Uh, next speaker, Whitney. Uh, next we have Grant Slayden. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you so much. My name is Grant Sladen, and uh, thank you for inviting us to participate and give input to the decision making process here. My name is Grant Sladen, as you know, and my wife and I just moved to 426 North Pitt Street, and uh, we just love living in, in Alexandria. Um, I also support Dash. I support the concept of it, and I've ridden buses here locally since we've been here. Um, I'm one of the neighbors that Stanley Stemp had talked to, and we have really strong concerns about the proposal to realign line 34. We haven't submitted written proposal or written comment yet because I have some detail that we're preparing for it. Um, but just looking at it, we've got some, some very strong concerns about it. First off, looking at the route chosen, I can see that the new route results in one less turn out of eight moving through the old town. However, it might be even simpler to run down North Royal Street and then you get even one less turn than that. So I'm not sure what efficiency is gained. Maybe there's some by having a more direct route, um, but there's even more direct routes than were proposed. Um, in the plan. Also, lines 30 and 31 will still run down North Fairfax Street. So the proposed change will just basically put congestion on two roads, Fairfax, Fairfax and Pitt Street, and not just one road. So it'll sort of double and spread the noise and, 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 and 
congestion on the roads. I'm also concerned about noise and traffic, as mentioned. Um, looking at it, you know, up to now, Pitt Street has been a quiet residential street, but having buses every 30 minutes starting as early as 5.30 a.m. and running until 10 p.m. at night, up to seven days a week, that's certainly going to create a different neighborhood um, than we thought we were moving into when we first got here. Um, I'm also um, looking at it, North Pitt Street. I walked down North Pitt Street and I walked down North Fairfax Street. And North Pitt Street is predominantly a residential street from Cameron to Bashford, which is the length of the 11 streets or blocks of the proposed route. Fairfax does have some residential sections, about three blocks it looked like to me, but it also is heavily commercial. There's studios and schools and businesses and restaurants and public tennis courts and offices and lobbyists and all kinds of things that are business related which makes more sense to me for a commercial uh, a route, which makes less problems for neighbors, perhaps, when you have buses running up and down. I'm also concerned about parking, as Stanley mentioned, especially if the potential improvements for the new bus stops will, quote, include shelter, bunch, bench installations, parking space removals, passenger pad or bulb out construction. This language is right from the proposal. And I do know that many of my neighbors park on the street. We don't, we don't have parking garages, we can't afford them. And so we park on the street and that's a concern for us too. And finally, all of these potential impacts that I've talked about seem to be for very little benefit. When I was reading the report, I turned to page 39 and it looked like the proposal estimates that this change will result in only a net increase. Your time is up. Please finish your comments. 7,000 passengers, which per year is just 19 a day or half a person a trip. So it seems like there's a lot of change and a lot of public comment for very little proposed impact um, to ridership. So those are my comments. Thank you so much. And thank you for giving us the opportunity to speak on this important issue. Thank you. All right. Thank you, sir. And next speaker. Next, we have Karen Branding. Um, hi, I would like to thank Martin. He came to the notice on North Old Town Independent Citizens Board meeting, of which I am a member, on Monday night and spoke to us. And he did a very nice job explaining that. One thing I pointed out at that was when you were planning this in um, uh, 2019, looking to new buildings, um, we really never know what is actually going to be coming in. And they change all the time as Old Town North is becoming quite dense. Um, if you take a look at those on North Fairfax, which are the new buildings there, um, 801 North Fairfax, the venue, the Muse, Tidelock, and Montgomery Center, which is proposed, that it, uh, based on the 1.5 residents per uh, unit, it's 1,342 new people. And you take a look at North Pitt, the uh, Lex and Florence, the 901 North Pitt, which has not been built, but you can even count the Gables, which is finished, which would not be considered new in 2019, you knew what was coming, that is only um, 1,104. So there's still 240 more people on North Fairfax in the new units. So that doesn't quite work for me as a rationale. My concern is the doubling up of all of the bus stops. Right now, North Fairfax has the bus stops, they have the shelters, it's all set up. But when you add those to North Pitt, again, you're taking out the parking spaces, which are so valuable in our neighborhood, especially with increased density. And it is a um, uh, what do you call it? it is a residential street and what I didn't understand when I just saw the slide that uh, Martin put up about where the bus stops are potentially being proposed there was one on the corner of North Pitt and Montgomery which totally makes sense as Montgomery is the retail corridor um, but there was also one just a block north of that on North First which I don't understand a block away the value of a bus stop being one block away that just didn't make sense to me I would ask you to definitely reconsider that also if you're looking in the long term of going into um, the uh, Hill Cove development and the power plant, North Pitt isn't right now even part of that plan. So you're going to have to potentially change this route again after you've built all the bus stops and it's not even going to go into the power plant. So I don't know if I would invest the capital at this point when that has not been worked on yet. Uh, so it may have to change at that point. So I would ask you to reconsider potentially looking at what you need to do to service all our people with the least disruption to the residents in the neighborhood and the best service of the citizens of Alexandria. So we do have the opportunity to go to the Potomac Yards Metro station, but perhaps without losing 
really important parking and understanding that only 14% of your fleet are the quiet buses, it is um, gonna be a, a disturbance to the, our citizens unless the board is really willing to um, dedicate those some of those 14 buses to Route 34. So I really appreciate you listening to us. Thank you very much. Next speaker. Uh, next we have Karen Kirkpatrick. Uh, Karen, I believe you have the ability to unmute yourself at this point. Okay, we'll give we'll give Karen a little time. Um, we'll move okay, to I'm sorry. Oh, there she is. All right. There I am. I'm sorry. I couldn't figure out how to unmute. I apologize. No problem. Um, thank you for the opportunity to talk. I am also a resident of North Pitt Street, and um, I will say with everyone else, the parking issue here is unbelievably difficult. We have just lost more parking and we have gained several thousand people across the street. Whenever we have a service person to come to our house, there's no way for anyone to get through our front door because there's no place to park. That would be a housekeeper, a, you know, someone to come in and fix the floors or what have you. You know, we spent well over a million dollars to move into these houses. This is a residential area. I'm also a user of public transportation, so I don't have a problem with buses. However, when you start putting up the bus shelters, etc., I personally know the amount of litter that goes on around those areas. And nobody comes along and cleans up the litter that's not the bus's responsibility. That falls back on all of the people who are living here. Additionally, this is an area where you have a lot of older people, 70 up, and young children and people with dogs. And the thing is, everybody runs through stop signs and doesn't pay attention now and parks wherever they feel like. And this is just going to add more congestion and problems to North Pitt Street. Um, I would strongly urge people to reconsider what they're doing to the people who actually own property here and are paying taxes to the city for this. Um, my, my, my emotions might be a little bit high because I have listened to the, um, the groundbreaking and everything else across the street for the last two years where I couldn't even work from home because of the noise level, but now I'm gonna have an additional noise level to put up with. So I, I would really say these are things that need to be considered, the people who live, own, and pay taxes to this city. Thank you for your time. I just ask you before you mute yourself again, what block do you live on? I live on the 600 block. Okay, thank you. Next speaker. Next, we have Laura Shoulders. Good afternoon. Thank you for letting us speak in this uh, on our behalf. I am a resident on the 400 block of North Pitt Street and recently moved here about seven, eight months ago. And uh, since living here, we have actually had a few noise complaints of uh, people who, I don't know, they come and they sit outside of, of our house. We're on the southern end of, of uh, North Pitt on the 400 block, and they have loud music and all these things. With the addition of the bus stop, I think that that would also contribute to even more louder things, especially during the daytime, nighttime, all these things. We'd like to keep it as quiet as possible. We have had to call the uh, non-emergency line a couple of times just to kind of get the extra officers out here to, to calm down the area. And I think adding that bus line 34 to our street would enhance these issues that we've already been having and would appreciate if we keep the bus line over on Fairfax or potentially look at moving it into Royal. I do use the bus lines quite often as I go to the Metro um, on an almost daily basis. And 
it's no problem at all for me to walk the two blocks to Princess and Fairfax at this point in time, even in all, all forms of weather as well. So we just, just appreciate you um, to look into keeping those on the other side of the street so that we don't have um, extra issues arise on our block. So thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Next speaker. Uh, those are all of the attendees who raised their hand to provide public comment. Um, maybe we'll pause for just a moment to see if anyone else would like to provide comment. Uh, Mr. Chair, I do not see any additional hands raised. Okay. Um, I just want to procedurally, before I let Martin respond, I'm just going to ask a question about just kind of process. So I noticed we have um, this Friday as the cutoff for, for comments. Um, we're going to, and other board members don't know this, we're going to explore maybe moving the main meeting um, for a matter of convenience. And I'll discuss that when we get to the chair's report a little earlier. But could we, I, I, I have heard that there are others on Pitt Street who might want to comment. If we were to extend for another week, is that something staff could work with? Just to ensure that there's additional time for outreach because there are folks who want to speak to their neighbors with that. Yeah, I think that would we be, do that? We have a comment okay. that, yeah. All right, so we will we will extend comments now till, till April 23rd. I'm gonna let Martin respond to some of the speakers and, and points that he wishes uh, to, to highlight. So go ahead. Sure, thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, I appreciate it. There were a lot of comments and, and I think those also were an accurate representation of a lot of the, the written comments we received. So it was a good, uh, the, I'm glad the board was able to hear that. Um, I think just, I'm not going to respond to, to all the, the points uh, I won't be able to, but I just wanted to note a couple of things. Uh, one gentleman had asked about the comments um, and the number that were supportive or, or in opposition. Um, the, the vast majority were in opposition. They were mostly residents living along North Pitt Street, um, mm -hmm. as we've heard tonight. Uh, there were a few neutral uh, respondents and I think one uh, to two that were very supportive of it. Um, you know, we, we did have some support when we went to the, uh, the notice, the Civic Association in Old Town. We had the, the, the meeting on Monday. We did hear some positive feedback from that group about this proposed change. Uh, but, but yes, the majority of the comments were, were in opposition to it. Um, the other two uh, comments I was going to respond to, uh, there was a question about the, um, the bus stops and shelters that might go in. Um, you know, I, I think uh, there's a process for where we identify which bus stops uh, weren't having a shelter or a bench or other amenities. Um, that's usually based on ridership uh, is the main factor. Um, you know, we're, we're not at any point where we're determining that um, you know, we have shelters on this. I think, I think that'd be unlikely in the near term based on ridership. Uh, North Fairfax Street has higher ridership, so that's why we have shelters there. Um, at least to begin with, we would not expect um, to have shelters here. Um, you know, there are a lot of other areas in the, in the system where we want to put shelters that would be higher priority than this. Um, so that's not something that we're pursuing. Martin, if I could, just because I, I live very close to that, to, to Fairfax and to Pitt, um, I believe there's only one bus stop on Fairfax, that, on North Fairfax that has a shelter. Am I still correct about that? The vast majority of stops just have a concrete pad and a pole uh, with a sign. Right, we'd be looking to add shelters there before we would look to add shelters. Right, there. right, interesting. So, yeah. Um, and then the last point, uh, I think there was a question about the bus stop map that was shown. Um, I just want to stress that that is a very preliminary potential uh, map. We showed uh, more stops rather than less to kind of give them a sense of uh, where, where stops potentially could be. I would imagine that the ultimate, uh, if, if this is implemented, there would be far, there would be fewer stops than it would have shown on that map. So I think there was a comment about stops being one block apart from each other. It's unlikely that that would play out, but we just wanted to give a full uh, picture of what, what could be out there. Um, unless there's, uh, I'm happy to, to stay up and answer questions. We put the slide with the stops because we went through that rather quickly. I wasn't really able to, to see where all the stops were marked on. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, you can see that we have it about every two blocks. Uh, this is based on you know, some uh, bus. We've taken a couple buses through there and identified areas where we think that the parking impact will be minimized um, and where it will be safe to be able to pull pull into the uh, the curb so that we have uh, the ability for people in wheelchairs, for example, to board the buses. Um, we have to make sure that we're accommodating those individuals. Uh, we can't just stop in the middle of the street, unfortunately. So Queen Orinoco with. Montgomery and first potentially. Um, okay. um, so we don't have this is we're going to have this for approval in May, but we don't have we're not revisiting this agenda item tonight. So if we have questions, this would be the appropriate time to so engage with you. Is that? I mean, that's fine. If you'd like to do it's your your call. You can either do that or have him come talk about it in his regular presentation. Matt had a question. Um, Martin, I 
don't agree that it adds congestion because buses remove congestion as a premise as long as people are using them, and that's great. Um, what I don't understand is moving it from Fairfax and just putting one lane, line hanging out there on uh, on Pitt. You know, we've we've always when we redid the routes, it was always to increase frequency. So if you had three lines running down one road, it's more frequent. Of course, you know, one of them is going to the other metro. Um, you know, it just seems like it would add more confusion by just moving this random line up two blocks. What what went into the decision to move it up to Pitt? Sure. Yeah. Thank you for the question. So, uh, with the ATV design, um, yeah, you're right. That we have two routes on a, on a corridor that kind of doubles the frequency in effect. Um, that is usually the case in longer corridors where you have a longer segment where they're kind of sharing the same same corridor. Um, when you have a short segment like this, there's really not a lot of um, you know shared destinations where you could stand at the corner of Orinoco and and, and uh, Fairfax. And you can either take this bus, the 30, the 31, or the 34. Right? The, the one exception is probably City Hall. You can take that down to City Hall. Well, just a quick follow up then. Why not have, since 34 is not going to Braddock Road and the two others are going to Braddock Road, why wouldn't you move like 30 or 31 over and keep 34 on um, Fairfax? See what I'm saying? Because those two are, you know, those yeah. people are only, they have one choice, it's to go to Braddock Road, where at least. It, it, does, does that make sense? Yes, yes. Yeah. So, so it actually goes back to your original point, which is that the 30 and the 31 are designed to work together. So they, they double the frequency okay. when they run. So they're, they're scheduled. It doesn't always work out this way, but they're scheduled to be offset so that if, the, if they're both running every 15 minutes, one of those two buses arriving every seven and a half minutes. Okay. Um, the other factor is that there's not a shared terminus with the 34. I, I mean, you've got Braddock Road, but it's, it's difficult to, to coordinate the schedules in such a way where they'd actually you know, be offset. Um, you know, the 30 and 31 at Braddock Road. So they both started Braddock Road. Uh, I got you. I got you. Okay. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Thanks. Sure. I have questions, but I want to, I, I think what I'll do, you're coming back up for planning reports, so we'll, I'll take that up because I want to think about my question a little bit before I ask. But if there's anyone else who wants to um, ask anything of Martin now, um, that's fine. All right, well, we'll hear from you again. So thank you. And thank you to all our speakers uh, for participating tonight. We look forward to any further comments that are that are to be submitted. Um, all right, let's go ahead and approve the meeting minutes from March 9th. They were included. Oh, Mr. Chair, you still have standard public comment. Oh, that's so right. So you, you need to close your close your public hearing and then open your. Okay. Do we need a motion to close public hearing? I think hearing. you. I think you can public just. You can just do it as chair. Uh, public comment, which Josh is right. I'm. I'm out of practice on this. <laughs> so it's just we haven't just done a lot of this room and being able to see some at this podium is, yeah. <laughs> uh, is throwing me off. So we invited every meeting for folks who wish to ask questions about any aspects of Dash. Um, or transit operations, we have folks in the room who can answer those questions, and so we always include a public comment opportunity. The same rules in terms of how to be recognized, raising your hand on the Zoom um, to, to be um, recognized by staff, three minutes uh, per speaker applies. So I will go ahead and ask Whitney if we have any speakers who are signed up in advance. I do see a raised hand, so I think we'll have at least one person. And, and Mr. Chair, just for point of order, it's typically not related to the previous to the hearing. So you've, as closing the hearing, you you are no longer hearing feedback about the TDP. Right. I mean, I'm yeah. I, if just someone for, stays with just for the public, I'm not going to cut them yeah, off. Yeah, just for yes, the, thank you. That is a that is an important clarification. Yeah. But we, we want to hear from you whatever your feedback is. So we'll go ahead and recognize the first speaker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I do have one person who signed up in advance for public comment. It was Stanley Stemp, but he did provide comment for the proposed service changes. So I'm not sure, Stanley, if you had any. Additional comments for anything other than the proposed service changes? All right, I, I don't believe he's coming off of me. Oh, there we go. I think now he has the ability to speak. Uh, Mr. Sims, did you have any additional comments? No additional comments. Uh, I do still wonder, though, how many. Uh, comments would make a difference to, to the board of making a decision. Is it if I can get 50 people to sign a petition, if I get 100 people, like what's it going to take to listen to the people that actually live on the street? And 
No. I'll just leave it at that. I've extended public comment, so that way anyone who wishes to weigh in on this has the opportunity to, to do so. And yeah. um, we will we will consider all comments at the main meeting. I appreciate it. And uh, the raised hand that I see uh, virtually is Laura Shoulders. Laura, you're recognized. Um, yes, sir. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak. I appreciate it. Um, I also forgot to mention last time, Mr. Stemp was the one who actually notified me of um, of this proposal as well, and I had no idea. Otherwise, I, I still would be um, unknown at this point in time. And I also want to make a mention, so like I heard a minute ago, and maybe I missed it, but that the 34 doesn't go to Braddock Road, but the 30 and 31 do. And Every time I've ever taken it, it does go to Braddock Road. It just goes a different way. It goes all the way up north to um, Bashford Lane and all that. And then it ends up at, um, at Braddock Road as well. And so like every time I go to the bus station, yes, y'all do have the 30 and the 31 that are offset. However, if I do miss that, I know that I can always pick up the 34. I'm just going to go a little bit out of my way and I'll still end up at Braddock Road. So if we do move the 34 to North Pitt Street, then that means that if I miss the 30 and the 31, because sometimes they do kind of go together. They don't go every 15 minutes. Sometimes they, you know, just depending on traffic and everything, they do kind of sometimes block up together. Then that means that I'm missing the 34 because I'm trying to run to North Pitt Street to pick up the 34. And by that time, I could have missed the other buses. So it just seems a lot more confusing, confusing, like y'all were saying a minute ago, than it does, you know, make it easier. It, it just makes it more of a hindrance to me. So I just wanted to put that in there as well. So maybe I missed something and maybe uh, it's not going to continue ending up at Braddock Road, but um, I just want to put that uh, in there as the way I it is now. Thank you. Some clarity. It goes to Braddock Road currently, but it will be realigned to Potomac Yard Metro Station when the Potomac Yard Metro opens. That was uh, when the, we passed the uh, transit vision plan in 2019. That was an element of it, but we wanted to run it to a metro. Um, instead of just having it terminate, say, at the shopping center when there was no metro station up there yet. Thank you for the clarification. Appreciate it, sir. All right. Um, do we have any other speakers, Whitney? We do have one additional speaker. Uh, Bonnie Miller. Yeah, hi. Um, this is Tom Miller. I'm with Bonnie. Uh, I've been trying to raise my hand the whole time. We live right across from uh, Grant and Chris. Uh, oh, Slayton know. on Orino we're on the corner of Orinoco and Pitt. Most of the comments have already been made, uh, but I want to tell you, um, you're hearing great vehemence. And what Mr. Stemp asked was a very logical question. We could get hundreds of people. Um, uh, we're on the corner. We have been living here for uh, over a decade. Uh, we have we have gone through just a tremendous amount of aggravation with the Chinese restaurant, which is finally being turned, uh, torn down and a townhouse is being built right across the street from us with a lot, and it attracts, um, it attracts a lot of people. And the bus stop will also attract uh, uh, people, mostly young, uh, they're good people, uh, but they're noisy and they make a lot of mess. There's a lot of trash that is around. And that's what our fear about the bus stop is. All the other comments about, um, uh, we don't understand why you can't just keep this stuff on Fairfax. Uh, I just, I associate myself with, but I, I must tell you that we feel very, very strongly about this. Uh, I really wonder what led to this decision. Um, and it doesn't make any sense to us to put one, one bus, bu, bu, uh, bus route on Pitt and the other, keep the other two on Fairfax. God knows we don't want to see them all on Pitt. It's a quiet neighborhood. We don't want buses. Uh, they're going to be loud. They're going to be noisy. And I haven't seen any arguments yet. And please answer um, the earlier question about how many signatures do you need to turn this around? Um, I don't, I, I'm just getting, I'm getting a sense of a lot of bureaucratic doublespeak and uh, we feel very, very strongly about this, my wife and myself. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, sir. Anybody else for public comment, Whitney? 
There are no more raised hands for a public comment, Mr. Chair. All right, we'll go ahead and close public comment. Thank you so much. Approval of the meeting minutes from the March um, 9th meeting were included in our packet. Are there any corrections or additions to the minutes? If not, I'll take a motion to approve them. Mr. Chair, so moved. Moved by Matt. Is there a second? Aye. Steve, all in favor? Say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Passes unanimously. Larry's still here, so let's <laughs> Don't you miss this, Larry? I do, I do. Uh, Mr. Chair, if you could do this at the podium, that way the people who oh, are watching okay. would be able to see. We'll throw the camera. Where, where should I be? You may stand with him at the podium, if you'd like. <laughs> So if I just stand here, they'll be able to hear them. Yeah, we can see you. Okay. Hear you. Yeah. Either my back to the board or my back to the staff. So I apologize. So we'll, I'll, I'll, I'll do it this way. But um, all right. So Larry, um, you joined our board a month before COVID. Um, you and I have something in common in that we both applied to be on this board twice before we were seated. And we very much appreciated your persistence in coming back because um, when you came back and you interviewed with us again, we realized um, you had tremendous skill sets that um, were very valuable to us. Your work in communications and public relations, um, something a skill set we didn't really have on the board. You represented a neighborhood, um, College Clover Park, um, Clover College Park, that um, had um, a lot of changes as part of the ATV, and there were a lot of community members who had engaged with, with us and engaged with staff, and we heard a lot from that neighborhood that Larry Chambers is somebody we trust having us sit around the table and helping us make these decisions. You agreed to sign up and serve on two committees at once. You agreed to be on the Transportation Commission at the same time, which was an important need for us and to have that, that voice, and so we're so grateful. And we understand that, you know, our, our personal and family lives have to come first, and we know you're a very devoted father, and you're doing the best to make sure you and your, your spouse balance uh, raising kids. And um, I appreciate you, you know, assessing, you know, what your commitment was and saying, you know, I, I think it's time for me to me to go because I can't give 100% to this anymore. And we, we understand, but it doesn't mean we don't, we don't miss having you around the table. Um, so we have a few keepsakes for you. And so we actually will be giving this to all of our departing board members who complete at least two years of service um, because we used to give a golden pass, but since there are no fares, the golden pass is just a piece of paper now, but it's golden. But we thought we'd do one better than that. So, and I wanna thank Josh and Beth who came up with this idea of providing a scale model of a dash bus in a shadow box. Beautiful. And just so you know that this is not counterfeit, because apparently there may be such a thing, there's a certificate of authenticity <laughs> okay. along okay. with it uh, that tells you, uh, is this signed by you, Josh? I, yeah. I, I think uh, Josh Thank certifies you. that this is actually one of the original run of these buses. That's right. Mr. Chair, you're giving us an incentive to resign. Uh, <laughs> well, don't get any ideas. <laughs> well, we have this bag of, of swag because we. Um, a transit rodeo uh, that Dash hosted this past weekend, and so um, we, we decided we would give you a t shirt and some other important things to oh, for us by. So, well, but come you. by and speak to us at board meetings anytime. And, uh, thank you, Mr. We Chair. We to see you very much, Larry. I appreciate it, and uh, really, we really appreciated your uh, leadership during a really challenging time for COVID. You know, for, for Dash. Thank, thank you so much. much. Just tell you, as a citizen, um, I really appreciate you know having served on this board with you and getting a better sense of what. Kind of leadership is going on in Alexandria. Um, I, I feel I feel better as a citizen and taxpayer knowing that uh, we've got Josh at the helm of the dash. We've got this great staff here and this dedicated board. So thank you. Well, thank you. We'll be sending them also to Ian Greaves and. Jim Capsis as well, who concluded their board service. And um, I think actually we probably should also do Kerry Donnelly and Richard Lawrence too. Um, so, but we're gonna run out of buses, Matt, by the time you're ready. So <laughs> that's, that's the last, Kerry gets the last one for you. So. Um, <laughs> All right, so. You better um, sign up quick. I want the hydrogen fuel cell. Okay, okay. <laughs> Moving, moving on to the, the chair's report, um, I, unfortunately, I need to start this report with some, some sad news. Um, some of you may have already heard this, but I wanted to share uh, that Bob McNabb passed away in March. Uh, anyone who was working for DASH or on this board before 20, uh, 2019 knew Bob and his wife Meredith very well. Meredith served on this board for six years, and Bob was always at her side. Um, Bob was a 
daily rider of Dash. They live on South Royal Street. They had a stop almost literally in front of their house. And for years, they had kind of engaged and observed the service. And Meredith and Bob sort of said, one at some point, one of us has to go on the board. And after Bob retired, Meredith thought Bob would go on the board. But those of us who know Bob know he was a quiet person. He was a very thoughtful and intelligent man, but he was someone who, you know, spoke very profoundly, but didn't speak often. And he said, no, Meredith, you're the one who needs to go on the board because you're the one who really can speak and represent and help to move people. And so Meredith did, but Bob was there sitting in these chairs at every meeting uh, that Meredith attended. And Meredith um, shared with me that Bob often would kind of mark up the packets and she came in with questions, many of which he had um, suggested to her uh, in his observations. Um, Bob and Meredith um, both, um, you know, have struggled with with physical challenges over the years. Um, Bob had battled and beaten cancer. It came back in early '21, um, and uh, he he uh, ultimately it was it was terminal. Um, I got to visit with them a few times at their home, and I have to tell you that um, I, I just was so moved by the the partnership and devotion that they had to one another. And um, you know, I'm really going to miss them as as people I got to know well through my association with Dash and, and great friends. Um, I have Meredith's contact information, as does Josh, so if anybody would like to reach out to her, I'm sure she would love to hear from her, her family. You can um, speak to me. I can get you her um, phone number or, or address if you want to send a card. And for staff, Josh can, can do the same for anybody who would like to reach out to her. I know she would um, like to hear from, from folks. Um, I, I, I think she's doing the best she can in the circumstances. But given Bob's, uh, in fact, when Bob, Meredith left the board, we actually recognized both of them. We were still giving out golden bus passes, and they both uh, received one because Bob really was a part of this. Um, I just would ask if we could take a moment of silence. And Um, next order of business for my report. Um, I, I appreciate that Josh and Beth uh, provided a copy of the electronic meeting policy. We passed this back in September, sort of when the idea of reconvening in person was sort of a very abstract concept, but yet here we are. And we spent a lot of time kind of this week and last making sure that we were going to have a quorum at this meeting so that we would actually be able to conduct business. And I just wanted to take a minute to go over this just because this will guide us at least until June. Um, there is legislation that passed that I believe the governor has signed that may broaden some of the flexibilities, at least in terms of when we can hold all electronic meetings. But that legislation um, won't take effect until this summer. And the city hasn't sort of provided us guidance yet on exactly what that changes. So this policy is kind of what we'll be working off of. And it says that we have to have a quorum in the room. So we currently have eight board members. We have to have at least five of us here um, to convene a meeting and to actually take any votes and conduct business. Um, members can be absent up to, so members can, can be absent as was before, and you can receive an excused absence um, if, if you're not here and have a reason that you can't attend. You can participate remotely as Kendall is doing um, tonight as we occasionally hear her voice kind of almost sounding like it's coming from the, the sky because it's coming <laughs> through the ceiling literally, but um, uh, when you are say um, away out of, out of the town or if you are, um, you know, provide uh, caregiving to um, a relative or you yourself or say, you know, recovering from, from surgery and under doctor's orders to um, stay at home, you can participate remotely up to twice a year. To participate remotely, you have to contact both Josh and me and you have to say a reason. It doesn't have to be a very, you don't have to provide a paragraph, you just say, you know, because I'm, I'm traveling and you have to provide the city and location, which we interpret to be city and state that you're going to be in when you participate remotely because that has to be recorded in the minutes. And so when I get those requests, I will respond and will approve them in the order that they are received. But if we get to a point that we can't have five people in the room, then I can't approve any further requests. Um, and we may have to then cancel a meeting if you can't be here at all. So I just would ask for the May and June meetings that, you know, just do your best. And I'm going to talk about the May meeting uh, date in a moment, but just, you know, try to do your best to, to, to be here uh, or to give us plenty of notice if you're not able to, just so we're not kind of at the last minute chasing around um, to, uh, to find a, a quorum. And again, I don't wish to kind of get into evaluating whether whether reasons are, are appropriate or not. I will assume if you come to me with a reason that it is appropriate, I just have to meet certain uh, certain numbers in, in the room in order to approve your, your absence. Are there questions about that? Okay. 
Um, so for the May meeting date, um, Josh is going to be participating in, um, is it, uh, you told me the name of the conference. It's the, the Community the, Transportation Association National Conference, and I'll be presenting there. So. And so, so you will be out of the area on the date of our, our May meeting. Now, there's no prohibition on staff participating remotely, so we could run this meeting with Josh virtually. Um, however, Josh asked if we would be able to move the meeting to the first Wednesday in May, which also because of a couple of our agenda items, um, specifically, I know also looking at the FTA application, I think getting that done earlier could have some advantages. We can't move the meeting any later because of timing when that application goes to council. So I'm going to have Beth send out a poll to ask everybody if you can make the first Wednesday in May, it would be here same time 530. And if um, uh, were you indicating? Shake, I didn't know if you were no, shaking your head. Yeah, yeah, no, okay, I'm just conferring. Oh, okay, okay. Um, so we'll ask if we can do that, and then once we have the results, we'll announce whether we can go ahead and move the meeting to that date. If you can't make either of those dates, that's important to note because then I guess your your vote doesn't really matter in terms of if we move the. If you're going to need an absence from the May meeting if it was on the second Wednesday in May, regardless. Then that's that's fine. You know, then just if you can't make either. Just let us know. Questions about that. And I'll reach out to um, Linda and Brandy both to talk with them about the electronic meeting policy and to talk with them about um, the, uh, just let them know to expect to receive the poll from Beth. Um, I just finally in my report, Josh is going to talk about the transit rodeo. I got to participate in the closing banquet at Jaysha and her husband, Councilman Aguirre, were present, I know, for most of the events on Sunday and told me about um, really, really great seeing the operators um, competing in the garage. Um, I'd never been to um, transit rodeo or events before. I know Dash had hosted at least once. Um, I was sorry that I couldn't actually be there during the day for the events, but I, what I really loved about the banquet was A, just the, the thought and care um, by Brian Roby and everyone who worked on putting this together to, to plan this event and seeing a lot of players that I know exist, DRPT and managers and leadership of other transit systems in the state because it was great to see the camaraderie uh, it comes from friendly competition also just how events like this probably lead to a lot of synergy that help to create ideas that help transit systems to figure out how do we navigate crises like COVID and the pandemic and all the restrictions that we were under. So it was really nice to, to see that. It was a wonderful energy. And um, I have to say, uh, Councilman Aguirre, who spoke at the banquet, gave what I thought was one of the most passionate personal speeches about the value of transit and the value of people who work for transit and kept things running in the pandemic. I think, Josh, you got up to the podium and said, I think we have our next Secretary of Transportation. Yeah. <laughs> it really was um, great to hear from an elected official um, you know, so, um, you know, who really truly understood and has experienced the transformational value of, of transit. So I will leave it to Josh to recognize our winners. You can see we have a large trophy in the room. So spoiler alert, we did well. <laughs> thank you. That's, that's all I have uh, in, in my report. Uh, Hillary, go ahead and recognize. Oh, I would do board member vacancy update first. Sure. Um, so Steve, I, I'm going to go ahead and recognize you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the subcommittee for the selection of the uh, new board member uh, took place this, uh, or the, we met this week, and we had a total of 13 applicants. We narrowed the number of individuals to interview down to four, and there were four very solid uh, candidates. Uh, we were able to reach uh, agreement, uh, consensus on one of the candidates, uh, and when we were evaluating the other candidates' uh, qualifications, uh, we tried to look at what value, skill set they could bring to the board that we currently did not have or perhaps we could use uh, to uh, supplement the current skill sets. So uh, again, we reached consensus on uh, I'll call it candidate A. Uh, with regard to the second potential uh, vacancy, uh, we had a 2-1 uh, alignment of the committee uh, for that individual, so we had two for candidate B and C, and uh, we had one uh, member of the committee that rated candidate C and then B. So uh, in uh, consultation with the chair, uh, what we're going to do is provide the applicant applications for the four individuals to all the board members. Uh, we would ask that when the video is available, and since the interviews uh, and discussion were conducted under the uh, open 
Copper, uh, Sunshine Act. Uh, we ask you to take a look at the video so you could see the questions and the candidates' response. And then at the May meeting, we will engage in a discussion of uh, selection of, I'll say, the candidate number two. Uh, again, they were all very strong candidates. Uh, I would say uh, if we had four vacancies, we would have no issue filling with four people, the individuals. But as we looked at, again, the skill set uh, that each candidate would bring, uh, we, again, we uh, arrived at the the ranking, as I described. And Steve, you're going to prepare also a written report. Yes, yeah, so I will summarize uh, the, I'll say, the, the key characteristics uh, that were brought out during the interview uh, and have that available also prior to the next meeting. I'm targeting next week for that. Do, do we need all four applicants? Why not just the three who are in limbo? Since the well, one you all agreed to, that was your job. You know, I mean, you know what I mean? So we're not reinventing the wheel and then not deferring to your decision making. Well, I think so. Your report will note who the candidate was that you oh, had yes. consensus okay. on. And so that way, if you decide you'll read that, their report and say, I agree with that, then that's, okay. we can likely dispense with that. Um, we have a lot of, because our, our, well, so our board roster right now is set between nine and 11. We're at eight, which means we have to recruit at least one board member. So we could seat up to three people. Um, I have I served on this board when it was only seven people. I've served on it when it was nine. I've served on it when it was 10. I've served on it when it was 11. Um, I think, you know, in my experience and, and also talking with, with um, you know, Josh, who's had a lot of experience here and with other transit boards as well, the larger the board gets, the kind of more, un, not unwieldy, but um, you get a lot more perspectives, but it also can be difficult to work through issues and get consensus. You want to have a lot of focus. So I have thought that nine really was our ideal number. But that's just my opinion. Um, board members can <laughs> decide that we want to, to go in a different direction, have a larger board. And that's why um, you know, we're going to allow you to, to look at the candidates and to basically answer two questions in that. You, how, many, how many applicants up to three do you want to see? That's question one. And then if you say two or you say, you, you know, if you say one, two or three, and then you'll have the names of the four and you'll basically have to decide up to the number that you said, I want to see, I, I will see three. And then you say, these are three names. I want to see two. I pick these two names. I want to see one. This is one name. We have to have one applicant. We, when we set out for this recruitment, we have to have one person who sits on the transportation commission because that, that seat is, is vacant. Larry, Larry's left now. So I don't know about him leaving us uh, without the transportation commission. And we, the applicant that the group has reached consensus is my understanding will take the transportation commission seat. And so that will be That's noted right. in the, um, in the report. Um, so, but I just felt like if we were going to discuss this in, in tonight with kind of a split decision by the committee, I was thinking for myself, I don't feel like I had enough information to decide, okay, I want to, you know, support this approach. So I want to give you all of the information that the, and the committee's deliberations and notes as well to then come with, to the decision of this is what I want to do. And so the majority of the board action will decide what candidates we send, candidate or candidates that we send to council. Um, and so we'll talk about kind of in May how to do this. My thought would be, and I'll have to talk with Josh and Beth about just feasibly how we do this is sort of like as council votes for boards and commissions, they get a ballot. So we would basically probably just do a ballot before the meeting that would basically say, how many do you want to seat? One, two, three, make your check mark. And then below that, here are the candidates. Who do you want to seat? And then up to the number and then basically we'll count them and then we'll take the, the majority uh, forward that way. I don't think we need to have a long discussion about it. I think we can all deliberate in advance and then come with our decisions and then we can proceed with the majority vote. So is our vote public? Well, it would be announced, um, okay. so the ballots would be read. I mean, each, so like it's not anonymous. Right, okay. right, that's a good That's a good point. So with council, when they put somebody on board and commission, the mayor reads and says we had five applicants and we'll read applicant A got the votes of right, right, council right. member of this. And so we'll basically, that's sort of what I wanted just to kind of move it along efficiently because I think otherwise we could get very bogged down in a discussion. I think that we can all come with having made up our mind, having all that material in advance. Does that sound an acceptable way to go forward on this? So as part of that process, would council then appoint at the May 10th meeting and they would be in the board the, by the June meeting then? Well, it, it, it could potentially impact when we can seat the person because um, I, I think we probably shouldn't get on the council agenda until we actually have our, our nominees, so. But if our meeting is on the 4th, 
if council will let us be on the agenda at that point with sending the often they ask for the docket materials far in advance but if they could work with us on that that would be great i just thought it was going to probably have to be june but if you can help us um make um, sure we get on that i can talk to Lori. If, if we're moving it up to the fourth we might be able to okay. there's two two meetings in may right there's a yes, but i meetings? don't know if they do board and commission appointees at both oh okay yeah just have a limit yeah so I, well, I, this I one that's, on this one actually is not a board and committee appoints so they they would they would come together as stockholders again so they okay. simply convene as stockholders we do a, a five minute version of it that. and yeah, basically yeah. yeah ask them to so it doesn't fall under the other boards and commissions okay so maybe it is the second meeting in May then. Yeah. usually the city manager makes city manager's office kind of determines based off of the docket when they can squeeze us in for five ten minutes okay I mean, just so you know, I mean, if we select people and they're not seated, they can come to our June meeting like I did before I was actually seated. I was selected, but yeah, I was oh, here yeah. as an yeah. observer. So, oh, absolutely, yeah, we would, um, you know, and and I keep up encouraged that, yeah. One of the reasons, and I'll also say this, that the committee initially started with looking at for just one candidate, and I, I sort of expanded that to two because. I didn't really want to go up to because, as I said, nine is, is the number I was trying to stick out. But also then understanding, gosh, it's a lot of work to do this recruitment. And Hillary, Ajacia, and Steve all, you know, gave up a lot of time to, to do this. And I didn't want us to be in a position, say, in four or five months, because we only seated one person, we're down to eight again, we had to start the process again. So I said, you know, if you find good people, let's bring two forward. So that was sort of some of my urging on that as well, even though I kind of was, um, you know, a little ambivalent about going up to, to that number, but 11 would not be my preference just because I think it, it has proven to be a little difficult to run, but we've done it and we can do it. If that's what, you know, folks think that's the appropriate number for the board, then that's, you know, that's, that's how we'll go forward. But I want to give each of you an opportunity to weigh in on that. So um, thank you for kind of understanding and thank you to committee for your, your work on this. Um, so we'll talk about this again. Hillary. Okay, thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's nice to see y'all. I actually don't think I was here before COVID because I had a baby. So I don't think I started until I went back to, to work. You had a baby in 21, though, didn't you? I had Well, you would remember what year. Why am I telling you what year yeah, you had? Yeah, so I, I think this is my first in-person oh, okay. in person meeting. So I remember you being in the room. Because we, we did a tour of the facility, because looking at capital needs, which is something. I came for that. OK, OK, I think that's why I was remembering that you were uh, part of that tour. But, yeah. So. yeah. So anyway, we'll all dive right into the really exciting, fun stuff like the WMATA budget. Uh, um, the WMATA board did adopt their FY23 budget in March. Um, and the kind of key points here is they, they had a value add on bonus fare incentive proposal, and that was removed from the budget. Um, it was approximately $8 million. Um, and the money is kind of shifting back toward reducing the deficit in the FY24 uh, budget. Um, also, uh, reducing the, that deficit is there was 120 million in additional federal funds that have been identified um, to to kind of go toward that that deficit. Um, and then also the budget did specifically note the return of the 11 Y, which was something um, that uh, I don't remember whether it was from the chair or from the board. The uh, we did submit a letter to, submit to them, and I know the mayor sub submitted a letter as well requesting that. And now it's, it mentions during the mitigation of the yellow and blue line closure. So um, I, I don't know if that's a, a permanent thing, but that I'm sure will be a key element of the, the um, that mitigation strategy. Um, my next item, the, the city, I think most of you all are familiar with our Vision Zero program. Um, we have a policy to reduce uh, crashes that result in fatal or severe injuries to zero by the year 2028. And um, this, uh, the every year we present to the Transportation Commission. So at the March uh, 16th Transportation Committee meeting, um, staff presented on the Vision Zero program. And, and I put some links in the packet because we uh, we do an annual report that kind of goes over all of the different safety improvements throughout the city. Um, and it, some of it's smaller stuff that you don't really see, but when you look at it all together, you do realize we, we've done quite a bit um, for safety through the Vision Zero program. But this year was a year we also updated our crash analysis, which we do every five years. So um, we looked at five-year crash tra trends as well as 10-year crash trends um, since it, um, we've been kind of working through the complete streets policy and, and trying to 
implement a lot of safety measures over the past 10 years, we wanted to make sure we were looking at that as well. And so we have um, reports and summaries and easy to see charts and trends and maps of high crash locations and high crash corridors um, online. And, and I'll also note, you know, the high crash locations are, are ones that's where we tend to go after grants to do bigger intersection improvements um, for, for safety. Um, Duke Street in motion, our Duke Street Transit Way project, I think I mentioned last month, um, we the council had just approved the composition of the ad hoc group. Um, the city manager has made a selection, which I was looking to see if it went out. I, um, it'll probably go out to council tonight or tomorrow, uh, the selection of, of those members, but the Dash Bus uh, Riders Group does have a representative, as does the Transportation Commission. Um, the, the makeup, I think, is a really uh, good representation of people from various neighborhoods uh, across the, in, the entire corridor. Um, so I think it was a really good process and good outcome for who's on that group. So you all should, I was hoping it would be out and I could talk a little bit more about it, but it'll be out very soon. Um, the first meeting of that group is going to be April 27th, open to the public. Um, and then staff is actually having an all day uh, kind of Duke Street Transit Way kickoff meeting tomorrow. So we have some dash stuff there. I'll be there. We're doing um, a bus tour using a dash bus um, to kind of go along the corridor and stop and, and, and look at things and, and start some conversations with our consultant and engagement teams. So we're diving right into that process and it's something that it's going to be a huge project um, for us in a big time, um, putting a lot of time and effort into this project over the next year to start developing concepts for what Duke Street will ultimately look like. Um, one other project I wanted to highlight um, is the Mount Vernon Avenue North project. Um, this is a project we've been getting feedback from the community for a number of years, and, and specifically through the ATV engagement, we got a lot of feedback about kind of concerns and issues um, at transit stop and accessing transit stops along uh, the Mount Vernon corridor in Arlandria. Uh, we also got a lot of feedback from the community during the Arlandria small planning process. Um, and so we've kind of taken that feedback and we're looking at intersection and transit improvements along that corridor. Um, the, the Mount Vernon and Glebe Road intersection is included. Uh, those concepts are going out to the community for uh, additional feedback, but it's a it's an exciting pro project. There's some pretty cool uh, intersection ideas. So I would encourage you all to um, check those out and, and provide your feedback on those. Um, but I, you know, it's a really important transit corridor and focus area. Um, it's also one of our higher crash uh, corridors. So we're excited to finally kind of get to that, that stage. And then um, lastly, I just wanted to update you on our paratransit program, which I've been saying I will come to the board and do a presentation, which I'm going to do next month now, a week sooner than I thought. Um, but we finally awarded a contract, which was kind of part of the delay. We had released an RFP uh, for our uh, paratransit services last year, and we awarded a contract to our service provider, but um, we had also put out as part of that bid for data collection and route matching services. And so we've we've awarded our contract to VIA. Um, we've been working with them to kind of get through the, the terms and conditions, but it's they're an exciting company. Um, they have they actually run some full paratransit um, programs in Hampton Roads and in other cities. Um, for us, they're just going to be supplying the, the kind of backbone in, in that data. But what that data is allowing us to do is really do better route matching, do better ride sharing, giving our customers um, more options for how to book rides online. Or I mean, they can they'll still be able to use the phone, but by doing this, um, I, I think we'll be able to kind of scale back some of the more restrictive elements of it. Like right now, um, customers have to make a, a reservation 24 hours in advance. We're trying to do more real time um, driver, uh, driver, what is the word I'm looking for? Not dispensing. Dispatch. 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 <laughs> That's it. You don't um, want to dispense. Like dis <laughs> driver <laughs> dispatch. Dispense 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 dispense. But also, well, with their, their their data, we'll be able to kind of look at trends and routes and, and see what's, um, you know, are, are there are there certain trips we should be making and sharing and, and just being more efficient and also looking at some other things like can we expand our, our boundaries with this service and maybe go e even further than we're required by ADA. Um, so it's an exciting step forward and um, hopefully next month I'll be able to kind of give you a more uh, full presentation on that and, and dive in a little bit more.
Hillary, how does that interplay with like Metro access? So Metro access, um, people in Alexandria can use Metro access or dot paratransit. Um, Metro access is very expensive um, and it's a, you know, the city subsidizes it. So if we're coming up with a program that is more efficient and better for our customers, that's one of the reasons we're looking at expanding it because we might be able to shift some of the Metro access clients and, and they might want to use this system. We typically have very um, positive rating of, of our service. Um, so we want to be able to provide that to, to more folks. And can they go anywhere? Like what's the limitation? There are some limit. I mean, they can't go to like New York. Um, <laughs> there are some some limitations. I think Metro Access is within the Metro it's, service area. Oh, okay. um, it, the the ADA requirements are that you if you have a fixed route transit system, yeah. you have to provide that service within a certain boundary. So for us, all of Alexandria um, is is within that that boundary. But that's also why we went fare free with paratransit. Um, within Alexandria because Dash didn't we have to model our fair structure after paratransit can be twice as much as Dash, but yeah. zero <laughs> times two is still zero. So. <laughs> Good deal. Very interesting to see Thanks. the trips um, outside the regionally outside of Alexandria if that drops off significantly and it's primarily used just to, to get around the city going. Yeah, going it, it'll be really great having a better uh, data provider because they they will be able to do a lot of these quick analyses and they'll be able to create dashboards for us so we can use them as staff, but we can also make information public about, you know, how people are, are getting around the city. So. Do you want to go in June? I, I, if, if you'd prefer, actually, that might be a lighter month for us agenda wise, because we are going to do the TDP side. So that's, that, I, I'm really excited for this presentation. I, I know you've been asking it. about it for, for a while <laughs> and I, I wanted to make sure they were under contract, um, but it, I was trying to get to you, but if, if May is a busy yeah. meeting, I'm happy to go in June too. Well, I just say, especially if we get additional comments on the uh, sure. on the TDP, it could be a longer meeting. I think June is, is right now a fairly light, uh, okay. uh, we're doing the FDA application too. I don't know how that may take some time to, to go through the specifics. Okay. June it is, it's easy to meet. That's great, thank you. Thank you. Um, other board members serve on commissions or associations or groups that would like to uh, share something for the benefit of the group. Anyone? All right. Move on to the general manager's reports. Recognize Josh. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Um, just a couple of updates this evening. Um, the first one here is, as you alluded, um, we had a spectacular state rodeo here at Dash. Um, many months and uh, many hours were spent planning for this, and I'm just really proud of the team. I think uh, we we really uh, knocked it out of the park, and and uh, and I know that that was the desire to do it. And I told the team, I said, I know we'll do that. I know that's what it's going to be, uh, but they delivered. So uh, that did happen this past weekend. It was um, uh, the first time since 2013 that it was held here uh, statewide. We do we do a local each year. Um, to determine who goes to the state, but um, in this case, we hosted it. Uh, for those not familiar with it, uh, bus rodeo is a test of skill. Um, it is something that is timed and operators are expected to navigate an obstacle course that simulates various different challenges they might encounter on the road. Um, as Jaysha pointed out when we were walking, I think they're probably a little extreme in what, what, what they are having to navigate, but um, that's part of the challenge. Um, so um, they're also judged on their presentation, their appearance, their safety, a variety of other factors. We also have a maintenance portion. That maintenance portion took place on Saturday uh, while the drivers practiced. And on Sunday, the driver competition took place. And then, of course, the awards banquet was that evening. Um, in the sense of uh, how did, what was our outcome, it was pretty spectacular. Um, we uh, had top operators. Uh, our operators who participated were Lonel Glover, Clarence Jackson, Everett Warren, and uh, Igirmi uh, uh, Bellane. I uh, have struggled to learn how to pronounce his name, but uh, they all presented uh, excellently and won the first place overall uh, bus operator team award. So as a group, they were recognized as the highest combined scores. 
Um, Linnell and Clarence placed first and third respectively in the 35 foot category. Everett Warren also won an inaugural Maria Boone Rookie of the Year Award, which was recognizing an individual who had contributed to transit and rodeos uh, greatly, but unfortunately passed um, last year. So the award was dedicated to her. Uh, Linnell also took home the safety award from the uh, chair of the Virginia Transit Liability Pool for the highest combined safety score. And he won uh, first place overall for the entire Commonwealth. So he will go on to represent Virginia in the 2023 rodeo. There is not one in 2022, um, but there will be one in 2023 uh, recognized. Our mechanics also uh, came out on top. They are second place team uh, for the first time in Dash's history. We've not placed uh, as a mechanics team previously, so we're just super proud of them um, um, and, and what they accomplished. For those of you who, uh, I know Steve, you said you got a tour of the maintenance competition um, and uh, it's, it's quite complex um, and intensive. There are various modules that they have to diagnose and troubleshoot and they have to start an engine that's, that's disabled. And, um, so we're, we're very, very proud of them. Um, I do want to point out, and for the individuals who might be watching this, this is the uh, state trophy. So this goes to the um, transit uh, system that is the overall winner of the rodeo, which is Dash this year. And it does date back to um, 1989. Uh, it will be engraved with Alexandria Transit on here. And the last time that this trophy was here in Alexandria was in 2014. Um, so we're very pleased to have that back and I'll put this on the table for the camera so people can see. So um, we're just really thrilled. And uh, this is a very important event also in the sense that this is the only opportunity to recognize our frontline staff. This is, this is their event, this is for them. This is to showcase their skills and it's for them to come together and have an opportunity to really participate in something that is dedicated to them. Um, so we're really happy we were able to do it. Um, moving on to my other reports, uh, in the board packet you have some communications just as for transparency and information. Uh, since the last time uh, that we met, um, uh, there were some letters issued, one from the chair uh, to, to the city council pertaining to the supplementals associated with the Alexandria Transit Vision Plan. Those were uh, endorsed by the board at the last meeting. There were also some other communications that came through and there was a budget question that was generated. So that's in your packet. I, I just would uh, refer you to that if you had questions about that in the ongoing budget process. Um, okay, so uh, the other reports I have here are related to updates to our rider policies. We're tweaking our policies in line with the opportunity that has presented itself as a result of going fare free, which is to move to allow passengers to board and alight through any door on the bus at any stop. We have a pilot going on line 35 uh, since the start of the fare free. Uh, also, I would note that through our young uh, and emerging leaders program that we have going on here at DASH, we actually have a program going on with a leadership uh, coach that comes in and works with uh, individuals in the organization who are aspiring to move up. And uh, one of the projects that was done by that group was an analysis of the uh, all door boarding and a recommendation. And that recommendation ultimately was in support of moving to this. And so we plan to implement that uh, as of April the 18th. Uh, the other update is stroller usage. We are now permitting passengers to bring strollers on board dash buses Previously, they had to fold them prior to loading them on the bus. They had to be empty. They are now permissible to, to roll them onto the bus. We spent a lot of time talking with um, uh, groups throughout Alexandria and getting feedback that this was particularly challenging uh, uh, for mothers and their children and, and, and fathers and their children who may not have additional people with them to help navigate the situation. Uh, and we recognize the burden that it, it does put on them. Our challenge has always been that uh, we can't block the aisle. So uh, the um, determination is that if the ADA seating area is not in use by a passenger who requires the use of that area, 
Uh, the driver may allow uh, families to board with a uh, stroller and with someone in the stroller and wheel it to that area and just out, out of the uh, path. So they'll be able to flip up the seats and, and have the space for them. Uh, this is also something that was supported by the Commission for Women uh, that Martin and I have spoken with several times uh, in Mar regarding matters of transit. So this was always a top issue. Um, so we're hopeful that this change will help to facilitate uh, more families moving you know, on and off dash. Um, the last item here is uh, an FYI item at the stockholders meeting in January? Oh. February, <laughs> February, I'm trying to think of what month it is. Um, Councilman Aguirre actually requested a, uh, made an inquiry regarding a realignment of uh, line 35. Uh, because of that uh, request uh, from, a, from a stockholder, I engaged staff and asked our team to analyze and assess uh, the opportunity. This is specific to uh, Reading or Reading and Rayburn Avenues. I'm not sure if it's Reading or Reading. Um, it's, I've heard it said both ways. Uh, in the case of those uh, streets, which previously had service from the AT2, right, Martin? AT1. AT1, I'm sorry, I apologize, AT1. Um, and uh, those were, uh, the service through that neighborhood was eliminated as a result of the, uh, the policy move to a more frequent high capacity corridor focused service. Um, and so uh, the efficiency gained as a result of not going through that neighborhood helps that service to be more high frequency, uh, more consistent, more reliable. So we provided a full analysis. Uh, that memo was transmitted back to him uh, in response and he acknowledged and uh, receipt of that and it is included in your packet. So again, it's an FYI item uh, for you all as a, as a point of reference if you have questions. Uh, that is all of my updates. If there are any questions, I'll be happy to field them. No questions. I was saying, Mr. Chair, uh, Josh was being a bit modest when he said it was a lot of work to put a rodeo on. Uh, having gone through both bus and rail rodeos in my career, and there is a rail rodeo, by the way, uh, the ramp up to the event itself takes months and planning goes out a year. And you're also meeting service on a daily basis as you prepare, along with meeting service on the day of. And of course, everything just doesn't get cleaned up and everything magically goes back to normal on Monday. Uh, but compliments to you and your leadership that you exhibited in making this all happen, along with everyone else in the DASH team that really put uh, a tremendous amount of effort into making it a very seamless operation. Because I don't think the uh, ridership was impacted by any shortage of crew, any shortage of uh, uh, any services. So uh, thanks to you and your team. Yeah. It truly takes the team, and, and they did an excellent job. And uh, many of them are still here working today and work throughout the weekend including some people in this room. And so um, we really appreciate all of that hard work. And Brian Roby, who actually uh, sort of took the lead, uh, we call him the, the, the rodeo man, um, and I actually competed right. against each other <laughs> when I was a driver. Um, he says that I won only because I'm the boss. I don't remember what I won against him, <laughs> but I do know that I beat Clarence Jackson, who has consistently been a top operator at Dash. So. I don't really know whether I could beat Brian Roby in a rodeo, but um, I, 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 it's been many years, uh, but I think I can still they, they need a general manager's division. <laughs> <laughs> that would be something to see. I would like to see that myself, yes. All the staff would be running, <laughs> running far away. <laughs> I think we'd have a fine contestant. I'm not sure of the other GMs. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, Mr. Chair, if, well, I just want, I wanted to mention I, I didn't in my manager's report I manager's report, my chair report uh, indicate that I did speak with the mayor um, after I sent the the letter um, forward about the um, the budget and we had a really good conversation um, not only about our supplemental request um, but also about the metro mitigation and some other kind of long term thoughts the mayor has about even um, you know Dash even looking to take over uh, one of the existing uh, high capacity transit lines the uh, what is uh, the the line that runs the metro way basically what we used to be called corridor A, either us or Dash in the long term, and either us or Art in the long term operating that. And so it's kind of very exciting to think about some of those possibilities for ways to, to kind of leverage some of the services Dash is able to expand its fleet and the, the facility. But I will also 
say that the mayor uh, expressed um, support for um, working through some of these issues to try to get Dash the remaining funds to do the supplemental. Um, we'll find out soon what, what happens this year. I know we'll talk about budget and add deletes um, soon, but I, I was really um, pleased with the reception that our, our letter got um, from the mayor and um, you know, look forward to, to working with him as a former chair of this board too. He really understands the value of Dash and trying to uh, work through and get the service uh, out on the streets that our residents are waiting for. Uh, so I'll go ahead and recognize that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, um, members of the board. It's nice to see everyone in person. I uh, want to give an update on um, finances, where we are year to date, and then with a focus on the end of the year. Um, so year to date, our projection, um, our, we are at a deficit of 3.3 million. The year to date projected deficit is, or sorry, year end projected deficit is 1.4 million. The uh, difference between those two is attributable to the forthcoming I-395 uh, grant reimbursements that we previously discussed. Um, looking at that year and uh, number, I wanted to go through some items of significance. Um, revenue side, the Mark Center that we uh, we discussed that was discontinued at the end of November, that is attributing about a half million dollar revenue shortfall. Um, advertising revenue that just hasn't been materializing as we've discussed previously. So we've taken that down to the contractual minimum of 100,000, that's, that's uh, an $80,000 shortfall. So those are the revenue items of significance. Um, getting into expense items, what's really driving that, that deficit. We have discussed the operations over time uh, at length in previous uh, board meetings. That is uh, that continues to be a, a significant problem. The shortage of operators is what's driving that. So that's attributing a $1.2 million budget overrun at the end of the year in operations. Um, utilities costs, those are being driven um, by the cost of charging those 14 electric buses. Uh, that's looking at about 90K over at the end of the year. And then prof professional services is about 160K over budget at year end. A lot of that is driven by um, labor shortages and the need to have contract temporary staff. Um, then getting into a major issue that, that has uh, materialized over the last few months, um, fuel costs. That uh, being driven especially by global events, um, looking at how we projected our fuel costs going into FY22, we used 1.9, uh, sorry, $1.90 a gallon uh, for diesel for our FY22 projections. That was based on what we had seen in FY21. In recent months, we've seen that go up significantly. Uh, the end of uh, March, we were looking at uh, just over $4. So taking the future months, essentially April through uh, June, we wanted to uh, forecast fairly conservatively. So we put that in at $5 uh, per gallon for diesel. So you can see this chart here. You can see it was it was trending over that $1.90 for a lot of the year, which was contributing to budget overruns just in the, the first several months of, of FY22. But then starting in February, it really just shot up. So that has really become a major issue going to uh, projected year end budget overrun of 900,000 for fuel costs. Um, so this is just a breakdown of where things are. The financials that um, I'm presenting for year to date are through the end of February because of the way our month end close works. Our year end projections have mostly March actuals. The Mar March is not fully closed, so those aren't final numbers. Uh, and then project the numbers for April through June. So that is an update on where we are year to date. What are the, the issues that are driving our year-end uh, deficit, both on the revenue and the cost side? And that I'll open up to any questions. Uh, and the operations over time, uh, does that include the maintenance, or are you uh, is that broken out separately? Uh, maintenance would be in the maintenance cost. So if you on this slide, you can see the operations overall line, and then maintenance. Maintenance is having some overtime issues, but they're they pale in comparison compared to the operations over time. Operations over time being the significantly larger one of the 
Okay. But we are, but we are seeing some maintenance over time, uh, budget overruns as well. One of the things I asked Edward to do as we kind of navigate these remaining months is not only to look conservatively sort of at a worst case scenario so that there are no end of year surprises. Um, admittedly, this is, this is a challenging end of year. This keeps changing. And, and then the, you know, last time we all talked, we knew fuel was kind of becoming an issue. It was like within a matter of weeks, it was all, you know, just beyond anything we've ever, ever budgeted for. Um, so, his year end numbers are really looking at it, all of the components. And so there's much small components like maintenance and whatnot in there. And that's all factored in the bottom line, right? Yeah. Yeah. Are the electric costs or electricity costs going up the same as fuel costs or? They have not as significantly as the fuel costs, but it, they have been going up in the recent months. Yes. And is, are we getting our money's worth on the electric buses then? Fair to say, I mean, I would say most likely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They're out there as long as they're running. Yeah. <laughs> and you, still, you, you have there. them running as much as you can. Right. right. Yeah. They're still in their shakedown, so they they tend to end okay. end up back in the shop for manufacturing related stuff. How many hours do you get out of them? Six. Uh, I About ten to sorry ten to fourteen hours over a course of a day. Oh, okay. On one charge. Multiple charges. Oh, okay. yeah. that's what I thought. <laughs> the plug in like your phone. Yeah. So do we do we know the cost of like basically running the same route on electric versus the hybrid versus the diesel? I don't know that we've been able to get that granular in the data. Um, I think there's a goal to kind of figure out what that might look like. We do get some uh, cost. Uh, operating costs out of our fleet maintenance system that incorporates fuel, but right now it's not receiving any data on electricity. And so I know that that's something that Ray and the team are, are kind of trying to figure out and we're looking at. I think that the long term there's going to be some sort of a system, a, a management system that will manage not only the charging, and I know you've been well into this with all the help you've been doing on the, on the grants, but a, a charging management system that would have reports kind of more like that, I think. Josh, did you say there was a flat rate for uh, electric service, uh, or does it, 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 or is it a tiered, uh, similar to a residential rate structure? Um, for electric, electric service to the facility, which I'm assuming that's the it's source. it's the city's uh, setup. Uh, Bill Egger with the city knows how that all works, but we fall under the rate structure the city has with Dominion. I'm not I am. Really don't know detail about how that. No, I was just curious that uh, you have a baseline, say over the years you've dealt with the operation facility, and now we've added on, you know, uh, demand for additional electric service. Uh, do we know what that is? And it sort of gets to the basic question: What does it take to run an electric bus? We would go to 100% versus the fuel expenditures, given the fluctuations that you have in diesel expense, along with you know, obviously increased operating. Uh, and maintenance uh, charges, but uh, is there a, a tiered structure so that we, uh, as we expand bus operations uh, with electric uh, buses, would we have an exp uh, or uh, a marginal increase in the rate as we start adding additional units to the serp to the fleet? So that's uh, something I'm I'm not sure about, but okay. I'll, I'll look into that and I can. Yeah, I was just curious how the commercial rate structure differs from say the a residential rate that the meeting would have. Steve, do you know, does the rate go down as you use more or up as you use more? It goes up. It goes up as you use more? Okay. And it's time of day kind of stuff. Yeah, well, yeah I was going to say, depending upon what kind of plan. We are, you know, we are recharging during the day because we're sending them out in the morning. Yeah, so they're going, your highest demand. They're going at our peak service. service time and then they're coming in midday and getting a recharge and then going back out. Ideally, they would be fully charged in the middle of the night when right. the rates are the lowest. But... Um, you know, I, I, I think we, you never know where energy costs are going to go, ultimately, I mean, candidly, but one would hope that they're more predictable. Than, well, yeah, it's controlled you know, by, uh, as an electric utility, it's controlled yeah. by utility yeah. commission, but that doesn't mean it's going to remain. I mean, you think as a public policy, you'd want to encourage electric use on buses. Yeah. 
and the more electricity you use, the lower the price should go down. Not to discourage us from increasing. Yeah, the that's, that's why I was wondering how they how that might be handled uh, as a uh, yeah a rate structure. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. You know, it's almost contrary if you want to do. Uh, you know, um, you're operating against the barrier that you shouldn't have to if you exactly. want to migrate to a complete electric fleet and you know, remove fossil fuels usage. Uh, you don't want to be penalized for it, for example. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair, you're uh, good. Thank you. Thanks. You need again? Mr. Chair, would, would you like me to proceed with my regular items and I'll save the two meeting sessions for the last? Yeah, that's fine. Um, so there are two items on the uh, the agenda for planning this evening. Uh, the first is a, a very positive um, update on our ridership. Um, so in your packet, we have a, um, uh, the, the, the data provided in your packet is a little outdated. I provided uh, newer graphs uh, on the, uh, the slides here. Uh, usually we have a lag in our ridership reporting where we have to, you know, for this uh, month we would be reporting uh, February data. In this case, due to the um, the timing of this meeting, we were able to kind of speed things up a little bit with our processing, and we were able to report March data here, which is very strong, as you can see in the in this slide here. Um, you know, uh, overall, you can see there's been a strong trend upward in ridership. This is total monthly boardings uh, going back about 15 months to the start of 2021. So you can see that we've um, we've seen a strong upward trend, especially uh, from the red dotted line when we launched the new network and free fares. Um, so I can tell you that uh, from August to from August of 2021 to March of 2022, we had a 73% increase in ridership, which we believe is a, is a record for Dash at least in the last you know, recent recent history. Um, so we're very excited about that. You can see that we did have a dip in January and February due to the Omicron surge, and we had reduced service levels, uh, but we have fully rebounded from that, likely due to the, you know, the free fares, the new service, and then also uh, the higher fuel prices as as we've all experienced. So. Um, Really positive news to share share here that you know what, what we're doing seems to be working, uh, and it's, it's something that we can build upon uh, as we continue to, to move forward in the ATV. And this is um, just a, this, a similar graph, just showing the percentage um, as it relates to pre-COVID levels, both in terms of ridership and service levels. Um, so you can see the service levels we did uh, were above the amount of service that we had on the street before COVID, uh, but we are now. And um, although this is uh, not quite the graph, uh, looks like we're missing the March data on this one. Um, if you were to, so we were up to 93% of pre-COVID ridership in December. Uh, we were back up to 77% in February. If you were to extend that line one more month to March, we would be at 95%. So, um, you know, in, in March, the, 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 we're comparing against 2018, 2019 data. March of those years was very good. So it's a, a difficult comparison, but I think it's safe to say that we're, we're pretty much back to where we were pre-COVID uh, as, as far as uh, ridership is concerned. So really happy to see that and hopefully the trends will continue. Sorry, Martin, it looked too good, so I cut it off on that slide. Oh. <laughs> I don't know what happened to it. Sorry. It's <laughs> the final slide deck here. So very 95% of uh, pre-COVID is really substantial. So um, the second planning item I have here um, is a Metro Rail shutdown update. Hillary provided an update last month, uh, but we're continuing to coordinate and work uh, with WMATA, with the city, uh, with the rest of the region on this this upcoming closure uh, kind of uh, i think hillary kind of covered some of the details but essentially there's there's two uh, phases of this closure uh starting september 10th there's a six-week closure of all rail service south of the airport um, which of course will have a major impact it's comparable to what we faced in 2019 thankfully it's not quite as long it's only six weeks as opposed to three months uh, but we, we are going to have no train service south of the airport um, and the reason for that is so that they can uh, complete the work on the Potomac Grid Metro to tie into the existing line and do testing. Um, so there will be a replacement service plan. We just had a meeting with Metro and some other partners uh, earlier today to kind of talk through some of the details of what that might look like. Uh, but safe to say that we are continuing to coordinate uh, with all relevant parties on that. Um, so more details to come. But I should note that the first phase is really the one that we expect to have the biggest impact on Alexandria. But there is a second phase that will be much longer. Um, and that will be for the yellow line bridge closure, the bridge and tunnel closure. There's a lot of rehab work that needs to be done on those. Um, so they are expecting that the, that, that will be closed from uh, September 10th through the spring. So we're looking at a you know, six month period. Uh, during, you know, after that initial six week period, which ends October 22nd, uh, this will continue. Um, but 
uh, the trains will be running through all the uh, stations in Alexandria. They just will be all blue line trains instead of blue and yellow line trains because all of the trains will need to go through Roslyn instead of being able to cut across the bridge on the yellow line. So uh, you know they're anticipating that after anywhere from 10 to 15 additional minutes to go around the long way, um, but they are planning to have some additional bus service on like the 11 Y that Hillary mentioned, uh, 16 Y, uh, 16, um, one of the 16s as well. Um, but we're also uh, there also will be some additional shuttle service as well, potentially from the Pentagon into DC. Um, so details of that are, are, are still being developed. Um, I have one, do I have one more slide here? Yeah, here we go. Um, and, and just, um, you know, talking about, you know, what Dash's role in this might be, we're still trying to discuss that internally. Um, you know, obviously there, there are uh, were a lot of things we were able to do in 2019 that we're very proud of. I think we really helped the city in, in, that, um, in, in that summer. Um, I think that there's a couple things to highlight is, is first of all, that was a, a little bit of a different situation. Uh, it was a summer closure, uh, so we were able to hire about 80 temporary operators. Most of those were, or a lot of those were school bus operators, uh, drivers that were coming from systems down at Virginia Tech or Lynchburg or colleges around the state, um, and they were able to do that during their off time. Uh, you know, that's, that's not going to be the case with, with September through um, you know, October closure. Um, the second is that in terms of fleet, um, we had a situation where we had 27 buses that were being retired that we were able to hold on to for longer, uh, and that allowed us to you know, operate the, the yellow line shuttle that we did. Um, so we, it was a, it was a made, we had about 40 extra buses, 80 extra operators. So it was a huge undertaking. Um, so I think something at that scale is, is not likely this time around, um, especially given we're already kind of short on manpower as it is. Uh, but we were talking internally about what we could commit uh, to something smaller, uh, perhaps supporting WMATA's efforts. Um, so we'll be continuing to work on that. We'll update the board once we have more information. And the same, we've been working with the city closely on other mitigation strategies as well. So um, yeah. any questions on that? I had a question on your last one. Sure. Ridership. Do, do we know what um, other jurisdictions, um, how their ridership is looking? So, I mean, I know it's hard to split fare free and new dash network, but just in terms of ridership coming back where they are, and are, are we beating those? <laughs> so, I, I don't have the information for the last couple of months, but but as of October, um, you know, we were trending uh, much higher in terms of our increase from August to um, October and November, um, you know, we were up by 50%, others were up by more like 10% or something like that. So, you know, some of it is the COVID recovery, but uh, that doesn't account for everything. Um, and we are planning to do a survey. Um, you know, we're trying to do a big one in the fall that might kind of be a little bit affected by the shutdown, um, but we're trying to do some surveys that will kind of get to more of the, the, the qualitative answers as to why people are riding more, um, you know, what, what's making the biggest difference, free fares, the service, fuel prices, whatever it may be. <laughs> yeah, and of course we've got the 7,000 series issues with the cars being out of service too. Um, so I mean, it's good to, good to see the ridership is still going up despite that, but certainly that's something that will come to play with the shutdown as well. Hope, hopefully it won't, but maybe it will. I had a question in regards to, you know, we sent the letter about the unfunded lines that, are, that occurred to implement the new DASH network. Like, what is actually the plan to like implement that or going back to city council every year asking for money? To fund these lines, or like, do we have that laid out for prioritizing lines? Yeah, so that, that's, a, that's a really uh, good, good question. So, what, what we would hope to happen is that if, if the city council um, is able to um, support us and provide some additional funding, um, that would be a service improvement that would be included in our current services budget going forward. Um, so, we don't have to, for example, we had you know, a couple of years ago, we might have had some service increases on a certain route. We don't have to come back uh, this year to ask for that money again. That's part of our kind of baseline current services budget. So, um, so hopefully we'll get um, you know some of those unfunded improvements, and those will be bit come baked into our current services going forward. If we don't get some of them, you know, we'll probably come back in FY twenty four and then request whatever we didn't get or whatever we feel is is needed. Okay. Another question in regards to the shutdown. Um, you said you had a meeting with Omada today. So, is there any update or estimated time that we'll know what the actual plan is? Um, we're having meetings about once every two weeks or so. Um, I think they're they're starting. We've seen kind of a, a outline of a plan. But I think they're kind of cautious. They don't want to commit to something when they're not sure. Uh, they're, they're having some of the same manpower issues. They're probably going to have to contract with some charter buses to provide some of the supplemental service. So I think they're trying to work out the details of that. Um, I think I think uh, if I recall last time around, I mean they they, they try to, to to provide some information. You know at least. Three or four months in advance. Uh, hopefully, okay. it'll be before then. 
So I, I would say maybe a month by now. We should a month away from now. Hopefully, we'll have some more information. So June, yeah. June meeting or something. Really bad. And, and I believe Wamada is going to be at City Council on May twenty fourth. Oh. Yeah. Um, and it, they were not. They did not say they would have a full plan by then, but they hopefully will be able to talk generally about um, some ideas moving forward at that time. Hopefully. Okay. But I, I also heard June. Thank you. Thank you. Back to the TDP. Um, I want to talk about the Pitt Street um, uh, realignment. So I listened. I listened to the comments from the speakers um, tonight. First, I'll, I'll just say I don't know if any of them are still listening, but for those on the board who don't know, I, I, Pitt Street is my closest cross street. I live. At, I live very close to Queen and Pitt, so I'm very familiar with the service alignment and that and that street and kind of the character of that street. I think a lot of the comments seem to be uh, along the lines of just hesitancy and anxiety about about change and you know and just trying to understand what would be the, the potential impact I mean we've heard from people who, who said they're supporters of dash and one person who even rides um, dash and I think they're just trying to figure out what what the impact is as well as, as um, and a lot of that seemed to be around parking specifically and about the stops and I'm talking with Josh yesterday it concerned me a bit that I feel like we don't have a lot of specificity about the stops. We have some now some proposed locations that were here on the map. We didn't have that a month ago, but I think it hinders our ability to go out and talk to the community when we can't tell them specifically, you know, here, here are the improvements that would be done at this intersection to provide this stop. We're going to provide one here. These are the number of parking spaces that are going to be taken away because then people can react to that or people are going to like parking being taken away. No, but they may find out that actually there's less impact on their block or neighborhood than they had thought. And so I, I feel like you know, it puts, and I appreciate you going to Old, I was going to ask about outreach, and I appreciate you mentioning you went to Old Town North um, Civic Association and, and walk them through the plan. But I, when we've done other improvements, and I'm thinking about, you know, when we added the service that um, was the 18.9, it's now the 36, that put Dash on some streets where we didn't have Dash before. We, we approved that as part of our TDP, and then that service was able to start in the following fall because all the improvements to the bus stops were made then on a very fast time frame. What I gather here is that, well, we would approve this in the TDP, but then the start date is very much in flux because we don't know what those improvements are exactly and when they're going to have to be made. And there's going to have to then be a whole other outreach process, which I think kind of does a disservice to people in the community who want to talk about this because then they're going to kind of get another bite of the apple. And it confuses our writers who view this as this is the time when I provide feedback. And then there's going to be this other potential process that could put a stop to it. And so I just want to kind of with, you know, Hillary and, and with Martin and Josh kind of just unpack this a little bit because I just want to see if this has been on the books since we passed the, T the um, ATV in 2019, it just seems like this isn't very far along in terms of the planning that would be involved. And it leaves so much uncertainty that I think residents do have a right to ask for some of those questions. They, we may not agree with them on their point of view as to, you know, that those impacts outweigh the benefit of moving the service. But if we could at least talk more candidly with them about it, I think it would help. Um, so I'd be interested in hearing from staff about, you know, the, the process and what we can expect going forward if we support this um, realignment. Sure. Yeah, thank you for the comment. Um, I guess I would say uh, a couple things. Uh, yeah, I think I think I think the the way that we go through this, um, you know, I, I think what you're what you're suggesting, I, I, see, I see that um, I think we had wanted that the we wanted the board to establish the intent that the service would be on this street before we move forward with trying to figure out the parking situation and kind of approvals for parking removal that may, may not be necessary. Um, so you're right, we do have this, uh, you know, once the board, uh, if, if the board decides to approve this, we would still have the further hurdle of um, potentially having to go in front of the traffic and parking board to identify you know, parking space removals that could be necessary for bus stops. Um, you know, uh, I would say in the last uh, few weeks, we've, we've made some strides forward on that. We've pro provided some tentative locations. Um, you know, we have an idea of what the parking impact would be, and you know, we think it's, it's relatively minimal, um, you know, in terms of it's a nine block corridor and we're talking you know, less than nine spaces probably overall. Um, so hopefully relatively minimal. Um, you know, we're still working out the details, so I don't want to, you know, provide too many specifics in case they might change. Uh, but but you're right, we do have some work to do with the city um, to identify, um, you know, what the process will be for, for removing um, or, or proposing to remove those parking spaces. Um, and I might defer to Hillary uh, to talk a little bit about the, the TPB process um, and what we need to go through uh, for that. 
Yeah, sure. So a couple of years ago, um, the Traffic and Parking Board gave staff administrative rights to remove parking to make a bus stop ADA compliant. But part of that was that we notice and that we post at that bus stop location. And if they heard from the community, then we would have a public hearing on it. So uh, this is one where I think we would have, <laughs> I'm pretty, pretty sure we would have community concern. So staff could just make it a public hearing instead of kind of going through that and making the community reach out. We could just say, you know, we know there's concern. We would have a, a public hearing on the, on the parking loss at, at the traffic and parking board. Um, so, you know, I don't know how the board wants to, you know, take take action on this. This is very similar, I think, to a lot of the, the planning processes. When you do a very high level plan, you don't have quite as much engagement on the specific uh, kind of in the ground changes. But when you go to implement, then that's when people kind of see that there's changes happening on their street and, and get really involved. So um, yes, there's public hearings here. And then there would be public hearing at the at the traffic and, and parking board as well for any parking removal, which I do think is something we've heard about in Old Town. It is a, a legitimate, um, it is a legitimate concern, certainly. Yeah, no, I, I, Some of the I, other concerns, I agree, I don't know that, I don't think it's gonna bring more congestion to the street. I think the buses are not that that noisy, um, but parking is no, real. I, I, yeah, I understand that. I mean, if there's, you know, I, I think then you're able to explain to people, okay, what are the standards as to how we put bus stops? We did hear some comments about, well, these stops seem to be too close together, but there's, you know, we have standards that we use in setting bus stops. But if we go to the community, and I listened to your, you came to our Commission on Aging Transportation Committee, and I, I appreciated that. I listened to the presentation. So I walked away from that meeting thinking, okay, this is part of just something that's going to be done in the fall service changes, but this is a much longer process and it seems only now are we kind of talking to the community about that and that's kind of where I you know had some confusion you know some not not confusion but just some some concern about you know how this is being sold and then kind of when this can be done and if we've also done all the feasibility you know for the improvements you know can we do a, a the bulb out or can we make the stop ADA accessible in all the locations that we propose do we do we know that yet yeah, so so that's that's a really good good point, and and I think we've kind of through some of the outreach, we've realized that um, you know we may need to uh, shift our approach a little bit. Um, I think that the the bulb outs are something that I think would be ultimately would be our goal in this corridor uh, because they are you know better for accessibility, they minimize the parking impact, pedestrian benefits as well. Pedestrian, but if you put it in a crosswalk, it, it shrinks the distance the pedestrian has to cross the street. Um, so I think the bulb outs are the ultimate, um, you know, what we want to work for towards. But as you mentioned, that those are those require, um, you know, analyzing stormwater impact. They they require, um, you know, permitting. So there's a longer process for that. So I think what we would look at is that for, um, you know, the, the the first phase of this, we would try to implement it without having to um, make those types of improvements. I think if there's areas we've identified stopping locations that would not require a bulb out, where you can still pull to the curb, they're usually far side locations where you just kind of pull the front of the bus up to the curb and there's enough space there to be ADA compliant uh, without having a really an impact on parking. So there's a lot of stops on this corridor where we, we've identified where we don't need to take parking spaces um, and we don't need to build a bulb up. So we feel those are kind of immediate you know, low hanging fruit um, where we can serve the corridor that way. Um, we may not have you know all the stops that we would want. Um, you know, there may be a little bit more of a gap than we would normally have, but um, we think that we can serve the corridor um, without having to build those bulb outs. But there would be a parking impact as we've discussed. You said, but less than nine spaces to serve an over nine block area with stops on both sides of the, because you've got to have a stop in each direction. I mean, that that's that's helpful, I think, information to know. And I think if you're just, you know, as, as community members going out and saying, we're going to take, and you're right, I mean, reflexively, you say we're going to take away parking. But I think if you look at what are the total number of impacts of the, the spaces, you know, it, it becomes, I think, a little more of just, can we look at this in kind of more of a, um, a can we look at this kind of in, with cooler heads, I think, in, in terms of that process? And that's kind of just what I, I feel like was, was maybe missing from some of the outreach that's been done already. I feel like, I mean, when we passed the ATV, that was sort of establishing that it was our intention to move. It was not something we spent, we discussed. It wasn't something we spent a lot of time on because there were a lot of other changes that were being made that had more immediate community impact that people want to talk about. But I felt like once that plan was in place, this was our intention to do it. And I just would have, I, I guess I'm just, uh, 
you know, it, it just struck me that we seem to be a little bit behind doing that. I understand staff doesn't want to go out, so we're taking away a bunch of parking spaces until we've gone ahead and done it. Because I mean, you you've had to deal with the slings and arrows. So. We'll let Martin handle that one <laughs> that time. Comes. You know, but I I do think I mean just to, in terms of just being transparent to the community, because what I don't want to do is we go through a process and let's say we decide we want to back this this realignment, and you know, and we say we're going to spend capital on this, and then we find out no, you know, we can't do it, or it's going to be three years down the road, or it's going to be so so walked. Because I don't think that's fair to our our riders and that's kind of what I want to figure out if we're going to support it this year I want to just know that we're going to be able to kind of then muster the cap what we need to do to kind of muster to get this through and ensure that it happens because I think then it also creates situations when we have to make other improvements when other communities are going to look and say well you know we're just going to adopt the playbook that was done in this scenario um, if that had happened in 1984, I doubt very much transit service would be on Fairfax Street, frankly, because um, you know I'm sure there were people on Fairfax Street with much noisier buses who probably didn't uh, want service added there. I mean, I can think about so many places, Commonwealth Avenue, which we wouldn't have had um, transit service um, on either. So you know, I want to ensure that this works, but I want to make sure you know we we listen to the community and we we try to respond as much as we can to their concerns and come up with the right balance so that we can get to a point where people may not say I'm I'm thrilled about this, but we can make it work so we can try it and see you know what it does to ridership. But that's you know what I want to understand what what goes forward. I think we we understand now what the process is that's likely going to be hearing traffic and parking board that we would have to then go forward and support that request if we decide to do this. But you know are we when would we be able to have service on this corridor if if all of that you know if we, if we make that approval and traffic and parking ultimately supports the request? Well, I think the, the goal with this is to tie it to the opening of the Potomac here at Metro, which you know we're saying is November. Okay, um, so that's that they, doable. Though? Or well, I think we'll just have to talk with with the TPB staff and city staff to figure out when we would need to to begin that. Really process. Think if we do this, then we get the approvals, but then we don't move the service for a long time. You know, I've seen other issues where then people say, and there were people here who've moved here since the ATV and weren't and didn't have an opportunity to participate in that discussion. So this is the first time they're engaging with this service change. Um, you know, I worry that we'll just be back here saying, well, you know, we're a transient enough community, we need to start this over again because there's new new players at the table. And I just want to avoid that because, you know, I understand. I mean, if it's the right thing to do, it's the right thing to do and we should do it. But, you know, I just don't want to then kind of undermine our capital and credibility and in doing it into something that the, we, we can't even make happen. And that's, that's you know. And what, one thing we might do, um, we've done this with the Traffic and Parking Board too, when we know we have a kind of a contentious issue, is just do a staff presentation to them that's not part of the public hearing, giving them a heads up and getting some initial feedback. So uh, we could certainly do something like that um, sooner rather than later to kind of gauge their, get their feedback early. And then also, which could help with like a deferral if a lot of people come, but also kind of gauge their their input and, mm -hmm. and, and work that into uh, the plan. But okay. I don't right. know how that works for our, our timing. And staff is certainly willing to work together and, and look a little more closely and kind of figure out, one, if we, if we did not get bus bulbs immediately, like what does that look like? Where do stops look like? And then two, if we did, have funding to eventually design and construct these where would they go and maybe if those don't line up or i don't know how comfortable we are shifting like a bus stop from one side to the other because you're you're able to construct a bus bowl you know two years down the road but if we're comfortable with that we could kind of have a short and long-term scenario play out too I mean, I think it's getting access to folks who, you know, can feed and, and can use it. And I, I really, I do feel, Martin, you've, you've made a very compelling case for why Dash is looking to make this change. And so I think that I think the argument for, for doing this uh, on the street to fill in uh, a gap is, is, is a sound one. And, you know, so I, yeah, and I, I just the other question, I, so with some of the new development that's already come out, was it anticipated? I mean, is there transit room for bus stops being accommodated in any of the things that it, so you have somewhere you won't have to build, where you won't have to build an infrastructure. Yeah, there's, um, in North if you Baltimore. look at the map there, the, the yellow dot 901 Pitt Street, kind of the top center, uh, that, that's one that's kind of going through the review process now. We do have a bus stop and bus shelter that's going to be going in as part of that. So we, that, that is an example. The, the green ones are already built. Um, unfortunately, we didn't, uh, didn't get into the process early enough to, to have okay. bus facilities for those. Okay. All right, I, I think I've said what I wanted to say. I just had a, a question. Um, the, is this line 34 when the uh, power plant does redevelop intended to be the route that goes through the power plant? Yeah, yeah. So as you can kind of see here, uh, what Hillary's talking about is the power plant site is at the top right corner. Um, it's 
to, it says Potomac and Angular, uh, right up there. So as part of our ATV, we, we did assume that uh, that's going to get redeveloped and there will be a, a street that kind of extends north and kind of curves around to connect the Slaters. Uh, there will be a, a lot of mixed uses up there, so we are intending that the 34 would be rerouted at that point uh, to serve that as well. So it just turns on the Slaters from the, the PowerPoint property is likely what yeah, will happen. Yeah, it kind of cuts diagonally through it. But Pitt is being extended into that into that project. Into um, that, that that part of it is not yet clear. I think that might be a later phase of the project. We may we may have to kind of jog back just a little bit, but I think that's still still worth it for. This might have to go over like Royal. So it be over Royal okay. on that block. Got it. All right. No, I, I thank you. I, I appreciate it. that's very helpful, and I think certainly getting some perspective and traffic and parking board earlier rather than later also helps. And we probably won't know in May when we have to vote to approve this, but at least it. Um, you know, it lets us then adjust soon if we if we need to and to understand, you know, also is there, I, I think there may be support for this that folks, you know, probably folks who are, are concerned about something are much more likely to speak up at this point in the process than, than those who are, you know, okay with the change, but I think it also needs, we need to go out and clearly do, do more outreach and also but just to share all of the facts of the situation as to the amount of parking that we're not building shelters there, that it's the stops are gonna look very much like what most of North Fairfax Street looks like right now and um, you know and I think one can go over there and look at and study what are the what are the impacts on that on that street if you're if you're concerned you know because it's going to look very much like that actually with with fewer buses because it's only one route that doesn't run as often right through as well but just in terms of the number of boardings and in terms of you know uh, other other quality of life issues that people raised I mean I don't see them on, on Fairfax so um, you know I think we can we can look at that as an example but I think, I've, I think I've said enough about it, but thank you for, for, your, um, for your for your inputs on this. Um, are there other questions for Martin or staff at this point? Well, if not, we have we have survived through our first meeting together in person around the table. Thank, thank you so much. Kendall, are you still with us? Or are you enjoying? Uh, oh, no, she dropped off at 635. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, she's, she's, yeah, it was like 1235. Oh, okay. Oh, right, the time difference. Okay. The board meeting has, oh, I see, oh, okay, well, we haven't gotten to that yet. The next board meeting will be um, either May 11th or May 4th, um, subject to board member input as to when we can gather. We'll be here at the DASH facility. Um, with that, I'll ask if there's a motion to adjourn the meeting. So moved. Second. Steve? Oh, you got a second, too. All in favor? <laughs> say aye. 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 I'm Thanks. sorry, who moved? I missed uh, that. Matt and Steve seconded. All right, thank you all. Good night. Matt's just very anxious to get home tonight. It's a long day. I better do. Yeah.